So this is the first time that we've had a graphic design master class uh, for Making and Meaning, and we're pretty excited that uh, you're here to both kind of be the test case for that, but also to really um, benefit from this new sort of module or workshop as part of the Making and Meaning program. So the way that the, the course is kind of structured is you obviously have the larger four-week program in which you're doing a whole series of assignments, but one of the really amazing things would be to put together a portfolio of the work that you've been doing. And what we've done is we've asked um, our first guest lecturer, Roman Jaster, to support that in a way where first he'll give you an overview of some of his work and graphic design, which is its own whole field, uh, separate from architecture, but certainly with different kinds of overlaps and concerns. And then he's going to do, uh, as my understanding, is a sort of a more uh, informal InDesign tutorial, as well as work with you directly in a kind of uh, hands-on way to give you feedback about developing a portfolio. So I think this is, um, will kind of augment the work that you've already been doing with Emmett, but also really give you maybe a little bit more of a professional spin on what it means to make a portfolio, which as you probably know, um, will be your, uh, let's say, key takeaway. Um, from the summer workshop, and it will also be the thing that if you apply to graduate school, it would be essential to have a good portfolio as well as for any kind of employment. So making a good portfolio is probably the most significant thing you can do if you want to have a career in design. Um, so just uh, a little bit about Roman. So. Um, He's a graphic designer working in Los Angeles, and he's the co-founder of the Design Yay Brigade. Uh, his work is focused on web design, well, which it's pretty obvious here, and development as well as book design, which is really what we think of in part when we think of a portfolio as something print, but as uh, today's mediums are changing, it's more and more web, so I think it's perfect that Roman kind of balances between both of those things. I'm sure he's going to show you a lot of his really beautiful work, but one of the pieces that I thought was amazing is a catalog he did for Sylvia Levens. Uh, it's a kind of bright yellow book. It's a catalog for the Everything Loose Will Land catalog for the Max Center exhibit. So um, I think his sensibility is like right in line with the kind of work that we're interested in at SciArc, and I know he's going to bring uh, a, a lot of that uh, design energy and also expertise to give to you so that you can make a fantastic portfolio. Um, currently, Roman uh, teaches at Cal Arts in the graphics design program where he also received his uh, degree in 2007. So um, today, after the lecture, I think is there like a little break and then the tutorial, hands-on type of thing, and then Roman will be back next Monday for a more intensive review of your work. So you have another week to continue to develop your, we'll call it a kind of template portfolio. Please join me in giving Roman Jaster a warm welcome to Sayer. Hello. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Devin, for that introduction. Um, quickly, I'll, I'll just uh, reiterate what's happening today. I'll be talking about my work for um, the first hour and 15 minutes or so, and then later I'll talk, uh, give a little bit of a, a lecture on typography. That's um, Emmett and I talked about what um, I should do, and and we kind of figured out that typography is really something that uh, isn't being talked about or hasn't been talked about yet in, in Emmett's workshop. And that's obviously something that uh, is my expertise. Um, and then I'd like you to uh, think about maybe some InDesign questions if you have some. I understand that you've already uh, started on your um, portfolios and we'll be looking at a few examples later and you know critique them a little bit. But if you have something specific, that you ran into um, when you um, when you used InDesign, it'd be helpful to just bring that up later, and I can address that. Um, my actually, my my focus will not be so much about InDesign, uh, much more about typography, because um, I feel like uh, Emmett has already um, talked about that. Uh, but I can certainly answer some questions about InDesign as well. All right, 
So uh, then let me get started uh, talking about me. Uh, it's already been said, I'm a graphic designer, I'm an, a web developer, I, I'm an educator, um, and I'm a co-founder of a graphic design studio called Ye Brigade. Um, I wanted to start, um, you know, the question, why am I standing here? How did I actually become a graphic designer? So I want to go back quickly, uh, show a little bit of my journey. Um, and it starts kind of, well, it doesn't start here. Well, and it's, and it, um, you know, the benefit is I'll show a couple of <laughs> very old photos. Um, the reason I'm showing this photo is that um, my journey as a graphic designer really started uh, because I was really interested around, you know, the early 90s in, um, in just working on the computer. And I would uh, work in a programming language called GW Basic, and I would make little programs, little games. Uh, this is an ASCII version of a, um, slot machine, um, and I, through this fascination of programming, I eventually, you know, looked at what else is there on a, on a personal computer that, you know, became kind of popular in the early 90s. Um, there's a graphic program, so I would make flyers, and eventually I realized, well, I could make a, a career out of this and, and study it further. But I didn't come to graphic design as, like, this kid that would draw all the time, actually quite terrible at drawing. Uh, I came through it much more from, you know, being interested in in, um, in the computer and then uh, had an entrance to uh, to design. Anyway, I, uh, maybe you've noticed uh, by my uh, accent, I grew up in Germany, but in um, when I was 16, I spent a year in the U.S., and this eventually would would bring me here to live here uh, full time. I went to a school at Rancho Cucamonga, um, that's an hour from here east, and, um, and met a girl, and, and now um, we're married and uh, live together. Um, but it started with me becoming an exchange student. Um, but I went back um, for a little while finishing up my school. Uh, this is me um, and some early graphic design work of mine. Uh, I did a civil service year in Germany in lieu of, um, of military service. And this fairly terrible <laughs> uh, typography there were my first, uh, um, or one, some of my first explorations in graphic design. Um, it's kind of, kind of funny to see this now. And maybe uh, when I see, um, you know, students or, or, or novices, you know, being very proud of their cheesy type compositions, I have some uh, sympathy because I started out <laughs> kind of in a similar um, vein. Um, in 1999, I actually moved here, I went to a community college, uh, uh, did, did a two-year program in graphic design. Uh, which, you know, involved some color studies and painting. Um, and I made my first portfolio website in 2000. It looks like a website that would have been made in 2000. Um, and I got my first job um, in a, a web design company in Orange County. Uh, and I worked there for, for about two and a half years before I became restless and I said, I need to go back to college and go to actually to an art school. And I did that in 2003, and this was one of the first pictures that were taken uh, at CalArts, and I like this picture because kind of it's, to me it symbolizes my excitement of going to, you know, this really um, awesome school, but also there's a sense, you know, this fear in my eyes, and so I wasn't quite sure uh, if I would, um, you know, be able to, to uh, succeed. Um, but I did, I graduated, and um, in 2007, I, I um, kind of started doing my own freelance business. And I didn't even do this as a, I'm going to become, you know, I've started a company eventually, I'm going to become a freelancer. I just didn't get a full-time job. Uh, I had some clients and I, uh, I didn't try that hard to get a full-time job and I kind of just slid into uh, doing my own thing, which looking back was probably the best things I could have done. Um, I started teaching. I went back to teach at my alma mater, uh, Chafee College, and I started teaching at CalArts, but I also was at USC and Otis for a while. Um, and um, I joined studio collectives, uh, people that rent a space together. Here's one in Chinatown. This one is my current studio, uh, which is in, in downtown Los Angeles. 
And then in 2014, I found a, a collaborator and my friend Nicole Jaffe, and we decided to start a company called Gay Brigades. And that's what's happening right now. Um, so to sum up uh, my expertise, and if you want to talk to me about any of this later on uh, or ask some questions after this presentation, so I do print design, I do web design, I also do web development, so this coding from my early days is still, uh, is still happening. You know, I'm running a business and, and I'm teaching. And um, maybe to add one more thing, I'm very proud of, I'm also an avid bread baker, so if anyone wants to talk about uh, whole wheat sourdough bread later on, I'd be very, um, very happy to talk about that. Okay, on to some of my work then. Um, I'll start with this, which is not actually commercial work, but when I um, looked at some of the portfolios that Devin sent me um, of, um, of this program from the past years, I realized there, you know, this seemed really familiar, these visual explorations, and I was reminded of doing something similar, uh, not with form uh, or, or volume, but kind of in a 2D um, um, way when I started at CalArts. So these are some abstract compositions from my very first year at CalArts, uh, just talking about, you know, co composition, uh, balance, um, contrasts, asymmetry, etc. cetera. Um, you know, these were, we just did a whole semester of form making. Uh, they became more and more complex. There was added imagery, but it wasn't so much about meaning, it was just about exploring uh, form. Okay, but then uh, fast forwarding um, to, you know, this year and actually commercial work, uh, my studio um, just launched this website for the Marciano Art Foundation, which is a, um, a art space uh, that just opened on Wilshire. It looks like this. It, it uh, renovated a Masonic temple from the 60s. Um, the Masons had left in the 90s and this was vacant and then five years ago um, the Marciano brothers who founded the, um, the Guess um, company, clothing company, they uh, bought this building and re renovated it and made it into a museum and we were lucky enough to uh, create the website for them. And just a little bit of background how uh, we approach a website project, there's um, a lot of uh, thinking in the beginning. There's like, you know, goals, identifying goals, um, identifying target audiences, uh, you know, thinking about the content and that all culminates in a, uh, in a site map that visualizes the entire um, site and every single page and every single section, creating groupings of content. Uh, and then we make wireframes, which are kind of blueprints of every single page, uh, thinking about the content without getting too much into detail into, as into which typefaces to pick or which colors, but just thinking structurally. Uh, but eventually, then, we design actual pages uh, with all the graphical elements, uh, paying special attention to mobile views. Uh, as you might know, websites nowadays function or have to function well on a very small screen as well as a very large screen. Um, and then we also, I'm going to switch to the browser here, we did some, um, some early tests. So uh, this is... Uh, like one of the first kind of coding tests we did, fig trying to figure out, you know, what can we do um, to make this website somehow fun? So this is an example of this background image. Uh, you know, this text is just stand-in text, don't worry about it. Um, just so we have something to scroll, but this idea was that every once in a while there might be this peak that comes back, and this image in the background would always kind of, could always come back for long pages um, that you could even, um, you know, click on it and it would um, open up and have some kind of caption here on the right. So that's something we were interested in. Um, here, the idea of the logo changing as you scroll and the border as well, changing color, kind of in a subtle way. Um, here is the same idea just with the black and white logo. See right there, there's kind of this change it's just all explorations. And you can see as I go along here, the kind of graphical structure came more and more into focus. Um, 
you know, now you already have some content here. Um, and it also got more and more simple. So we first had these quite kind of primary, secondary bright colors. The client said, that's too much. So we kind of toned it down. This idea was that this border, oops, that was kind of controversial. Uh, we liked it. That framed the entire, um, the entire website. Maybe it should go away as you started scrolling. So that was um, this kind of exploration here. Uh, we kind of thought maybe we could animate the logo as like a, an introduction uh, before the website load, loaded. Um, but this is actually the website that is up right now. So you can kind of see the iterations uh, and kind of this back and forth with the client. Obviously, there's a lot more white. Uh, the logo changed. We didn't design the logo. That happened very, very late uh, where everything was kind of almost done. Then the logo all of a sudden changed. So that was a surprise. Um, so I'll, um, you know, can just click a couple. Uh, the one thing that did survive from our earlier more fun explorations was this idea of having something in the background. So when you get to the footer, there's, it's almost like an Easter egg where if you click on it, you know, you can kind of see little scenes of the, um, of the Masonic temple um, as it exists nowadays. And you can click on it again and kind of, uh, it's like a drawer. And, you know, it's not something that, you know, is all that may be helpful for, you know, conveying the information, getting people into the museum, but it's, you know, it's a little nugget of fun uh, that we like to inject. Um, so, and, and that image um, kind of changes. So if we look at a couple pages here, you know, it's a fairly straightforward website, uh, although I would argue that kind of the sensibility of the typography and the care of, of hierarchy, uh, that's, I feel that's what makes this a um, successful project. Okay. So moving on, another um, recent project that we just launched is this magazine. And this is an alumni magazine, so it's, the target audience is uh, maybe very specific, but it, uh, you know, it's a print project that's very, um, very recent, so I wanted to talk about it. It's uh, called The Pool, and CalArts approached us um, to redesign uh, the magazine for their uh, alumni. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you're working on a project where you are the target audience as well, because I'm an alumni uh, of CalArts, so it kind of could filter some of uh, that thinking through my own experience. Um, I'm going to show a couple of, of, of spreads here. Uh, it starts in kind of an abstract way. It's called the pool, so we have this kind of beautiful image of water and an iconic image of a well-known um, hallway and campus. Um, table of contents. You know, in the beginning there is a section of smaller news items uh, called the buzz. Um, the cover story is about El Ta uh, Ann Talnes. She's a CalArts alumna who is now at the Washington Post uh, being an editorial um, um, uh, cartoonist. So um, we got to send a photographer out to Washington, D.C., who took um, photos of her, you know, images of, of CalArts alumni in the real world doing their work, a photo essay. The old and the new um, president. And as you can see, it's, you know, in a way, straightforward design, right? It's like bold, it's fairly clean, and th those were also our, that was our brief, uh, not to over-design it. Uh, some, you know, less interesting sections, like, you know, the kind of alumni information, new um, alumni council, we tried to at least, you know, give the drawings some, some real charm um, to make this section visually interesting. Um, and then in the end, you have a section of alumni sending in class notes. Um, what are they up to? All the way from alumni from the 50s to now. And that's kind of a kind of a heartwarming um, section, with cat pictures and baby pictures and people doing cool stuff. Um, anyway, 
quickly about our, um, our process here, which might be interesting, you know, this is the final product, but how did it get there? Uh, we presented, again, um, you know, ideas and, and explorations to the client, uh, thought about typography a lot, and landed on these three typefaces. Uh, one called Lapture that has kind of more grit and kind of more attitude. Uh, it's almost a little awkward. Uh, then the second one, Soleil, uh, being a sans serif, kind of a workhorse, neutral but friendly. And then Arnhem on the bottom for body copy, uh, just really readable and um, kind of semi-neutral. Um, we thought about the, the logo um, on the front cover. All three version, versions kind of inspired by water, um, uh, but in different ways. Uh, and the client kind of liked the, the first one, so we explored that a little bit more. That looked like this at our studio, my two collaborators um, blowing on the water and photographing the word pool underwater. So that uh, went on for weeks, and we have you know, hundreds of these photos. Sometimes it worked a little better, sometimes um, you know, it didn't work at all. Uh, but eventually we um, you know, found um, one version that we really liked, which became the, um, the kind of logo for the, for the front page. And the idea is, hopefully we get to work on the second issue in the fall, the idea is that this logo will never be the same, that it's always produced in this, this way, but, it's, um, but it always looks different. So that's kind of an interesting uh, concept, uh, I feel. Uh, you know, printing out the, uh, the magazine, putting it up on the wall, figuring out, you know, getting an overview of, of what we have. It's kind of, it was kind of a big project. Uh, one more conceptual idea we had was um, to color code these three reoccurring sections, the new section, the section for the advancement office, and the class node. And um, you know, if you look at the book map, this is how these pages fall. And our idea, how we described it to the client, was that eventually when the, when the magazine is printed, you'll be seeing from the outside when the magazine is closed that there are these three distinct sections, right? Because the bleed of the color will actually be shown at the, um, you know, when, when the pages are closed. And this is actually how um, it turned out when, um, when the magazine was printed. Um, and you can kind of see the yellow, the blue, and the, um, the pink. And it also kind of keeps those sections, you know, very, like, it makes it very uh, apparent that those sections belong together using this, this background color. Um, and then the very last thing I'll say, uh, we had some fun and, and embedded a little Easter egg here. I don't know if you're aware, maybe this is all CalArts lore, so obviously this is a very internal project, and we were kind of stewing in our own. And this probably happens at SciArx, mythology, mythology, et cetera. Um, but the, the founders of, um, of Pixar um, are CalArts grads, and in every Pixar movie, I don't know if you've seen this before, there's this A113 phrase, somewhere embedded. So there's Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., and WALL-E. And um, we thought we'll you know, put our own A13 joke into this magazine. So uh, in this picture of the uh, new, uh, new and the old president, there was there in front of this graffiti wall, and it says, save a cow, eat a vegetarian. So we used that, and you know, just put in eight one thirteen uh, uh, next to that, and I don't know. It's our little inside joke. All right, uh, on to a couple of other projects that are a little bit older, and they are um, about uh, a book work that I've worked on, uh, and. Most, and, and the two projects, the two next books I'll show are actually also about architecture, so it might be quite interesting for you guys, and maybe you've seen these books. Um, the, um, the first one is called Sympathetic Seeing and uh, is about Esther McCoy. Uh, this was a project uh, I did with the Mac Center, um, and Esther McCoy is an architect, uh, an ar um, architect uh, and also an architect critic. She worked from the 40s to, to the 80s, also a writer. And this is a book uh, about her life uh, in conjunction with a, an exhibition that happened at the Mac Center. I'll show a couple spreads here. Kind of the title page. 
kind of a quiet beginning, the table of contents, an essay, and you can kind of see it's quite, you know, it's a luscious white space, it's quite, I'd say, refined and, 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 and somewhat quiet. Um, And the book is separated into four parts, and they all have this kind of timeline uh, opening that explains uh, what happens in es what happened in Esther McCoy's life at the time, and what happened in the um, in California and the and in the world in general. And there are these moments of quite large typography, and at the scale shift um, for certain pull quotes. And again, a little bit of backstory here. Um, this is, these are some uh, documents that I uh, shared with the clients of some initial thinking. Um, the book is entirely printed with two colors, black and, um, and a red uh, spot color. Um, and we thought about some adjectives, the one here, homegrown sleekness, was something that uh, the editor of the book, Susan Morgan, uh, came up with, which I liked. Um, thought about typography again. And then this idea of adding a, a, a kind of pullouts newspaper thing in the back of the, of the book. You'll see pictures of that in a second. Um, and different ways of, um, of putting that in there, you know, either with a simple pocket or with a with another um, uh, back cover flip, a flap, sorry, back cover, cover flap. Some pages get a little bit more um, busy and, and energetic. And uh, as I said, in the end, we decided on this diagonal flap, uh, and it has a newsprint um, pullout uh, which describes the story of the Dodge House, which is a, a house on King's Road in West Hollywood that was ultimately uh, destroyed, but Esther McCoy spent years um, trying to raise money to save it. Um, and that story is kind of this added bonus that you get um, in original documents when you buy the book. The, the thinking behind the um, cardboard, um, we kind of liked, it's, it's, it's more, it's, it was hard to source cardboard that isn't, that isn't so red. It was, it was kind of um, um, symbolizing concrete, uh, kind of this building material. It became a little warmer. Um, than, than we liked, but there wasn't really anything we could do about it because the cardboard, they either had a color cardboard or they didn't, and we, we were also kind of pressed with time. Um, but still, it's, you know, it kind of still has a, has a sympathetic feeling to the uh, subject matter. Okay, then the book that was already alluded to, Everything Loose Will Land. Uh, Sylvia Lavin, she's um, teaching at UCLA uh, LA in the architecture school there. Um, and we, my collaborator at the time, Colleen Corcoran, she's also a Los Angeles-based designer, we um, worked on this book also with the Mac Center. Um, and it was an exhibition as uh, part of the uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, series in 2013. This is a picture of the exhibition. Uh, and the book itself is about um, Los Angeles architects and artists in the 70s, and this kind of special moment in time where architects behaved more like artists and artists behaved more like architects, and there was this kind of interplay between the two disciplines. Um, again, a little bit of process here. Uh, you know, we looked at a lot of typefaces. It was the 70s, that's why we, you know, this kind of this Brighton and the Seagull, uh, you know, kind of thinking about like out of the box. You can always pick a typeface that says nothing and you can probably get away with it, but it isn't very interesting. Uh, so we try to kind of figure out how we can um, 
choose some type of faces that kind of were conceptually um, or historically relevant. Um, idea, thinking about paper, we, we ultimately ended up changing um, paper stock in the middle of the book. Uh, so the front and the back was a different paper than in the middle. Um, looking at words, um, that's always a good way to start kind of adjectives. How would you describe the book that you're looking for? Um, you know, thinking about the cover, doing a lot of type experiments. And then we had this idea to frame the entire book with two iconic images, one from like alluding to the Watts riots and one to the development of Bunker Hill in Los Angeles, because those were the two events that framed the entire content of the book in terms of time. And that's actually what, what happened. We didn't get a, a Watts riot image, but we uh, in the beginning have a, a picture of Studio Watts. And I'll, I'll just flip through a couple of, um, of spreads here. The title page takes its kind of visual reference from the cover, uh, the typographic composition. As you can see, there, you know, there's quite a bit of structure to this that every once in a while is interrupted. If you, if you look at in the lower left corner there, how the text column just has to make space to not run into the, the page number. And this image pushes the text column in a little bit. And this um, caption pushes the text column in a little bit. So there's a lot of structure, but there are moments of, of push and pull and kind of the elements creating some tension. And then, you know, this might be also relevant if you think about your, you know, in a way this is somewhat of a portfolio of an exhibition, right? Uh, how to create drama on a page, how to create compositions that feel, don't feel static, but that there's energy. Um, you know, in this, this case, I would say it's done through scale, right? One big image on the left and two smaller images on the right that kind of start balancing um, each other out. But then also this moment of more stasis, you know, it's both images, the same scale, but conceptually important because they're same about the, the same, uh, they're both about the body. Um, so if you made one small and the other one stayed big, you know, the relationship isn't quite as clear. But you also have to think about a book as almost in filmic terms of scenes. Right, if you think about a movie, um, you might have an um, opening shot establishing the scene, and then you have a close-up, then you have a medium, then you have a shot from one side, and then you have one from the other. And a book could be like that as you flip through the pages um, of you know, one Im big images, the next spread, a bunch of smaller ones, the next one, a detail, etc. Obviously, you'll be also dealing with a lot less typography. We had, obviously, a lot of essay and captions and footnotes, et cetera, to deal with. Um, here's some behind the scenes uh, images of us working out the grid. And hopefully, this shows, yeah. So this is the grid underlying this uh, entire book. And what happened here was actually, I realized this is a 12 by, or 9 by 12 book. And if you separate that, or that neatly, uh, can be subdivided into, um, I think it's 24 by 32 squares. So we put a grid of those squares on, onto the pages, and that, uh, as you can see, uh, formed every single decision. It established the margins uh, on the left and on the top. It established the gutters, it established the um, um, you know, the column structure, et cetera. So it's a very rational way of designing. That doesn't have to happen that way. You could be more loose and make intuitive decisions. But if you feel like you're a very rational person, you like to kind of have this grid as your, um, 
you know, holding your hand, it's, it's a nice way of, it can become a little rigid. Um, but that's why in this case, we kind of made these moves of, you know, elements pushing things out of the way, et cetera. And, you know, having a lot of indents so it doesn't become uh, predictable. Um, the middle of the book uh, is um, a bunch of original source materials that are reprinted and um, what we were, so it's, I don't know, it's like a hundred pages of other design work and we were a little bit uh, worried that it would become a bit dull of having these black and white photocopies in there. So we decided to have a background color that is really prominent and kind of um, almost aggressive that the, um, the black and white images that we were reproducing would pop off really nicely. And as an added benefit, this is like the second time, or it's actually the first time, I suppose, where the, the paper or the book, when it's closed, the pages have a very prominent um, design themselves. As you see, you can kind of see that the book is separated in three parts by just looking at the, the book closed, which I kind of liked, because you have this yellow stripe in the middle. Um, and then in the end, it's um, you know, a listing of all the artists that were in the exhibition and their work, which, uh, which is a little more straightforward. But again, we took care to compose every single spread, so it would be you know, interesting and, and pleasing and um, kind of have some drama. And then the Bonaventure uh, closing this time period uh, uh, of, the, um, of the subject matter of the book. And something that I was very excited about, um, if you follow Christopher Hawthorne, uh, he's an architecture critic of the LA Times, and I like his writing a lot, and he wrote in his year-end review Everything Loose Will Land, the exhibition, uh, was the most maybe only daring exhibition of P uh, Getty Pacific Standard Time and also had the finest catalog, so I was very excited about that. Okay, quickly I'll show one more book project, which is actually a much more modest book. Uh, it um, is about the artist Noah Purifoy, who um, for decades built this wonderland of uh, outsider art, you could say, or art made out of trash and things that other people threw away in the desert out in Joshua Tree. And if you haven't been there, it's, a, I think, a two and a half hour ride. I would highly rec uh, recommend it to visit it. It's open to the public. You can just show up. And it's in the middle of the desert. It's quite beautiful. And we made a book of, um, of photography uh, of this, this place. So there was a photographer and there was a writer and we made a small book for the publisher East of Borneo, a pretty small project, maybe, I don't know, I think it's 90 pages um, and mostly images. But again, we um, kind of, this, this move of using big type, if you only have to say a, lot, a little on a page, this is just a pull quote, uh, you know, one way to kind of deal with it is to make the type really big and have this really dramatic opening statement almost uncomfortably big, but um, kind of establishes a sense of urgency, maybe. Um, and then, you know, these, these spreads that we designed of the photography of the art. Again, trying to tell a story as you flip through the book. Moments of just having one image. In the middle, there is actually a, um, an essay. And then more, more images. Sometimes it gets really quiet where it's just one image and a lot of white space. And then the book finishes with another quote by the artist. So it's kind of a, you know, it opens with a quote, it ends with a quote. And between those two, we try to create a dramatic arc of the, of the images. All right, uh, I'll show two projects that are um, collaborations with artists. Uh, I'm, I've been lucky to um, have some 
relationships with artists who create their art but need a graphic designer as their support team and I was able to work on those projects. So um, those are, have been the more um, satisfying projects I've worked with, um, worked on. And the first one I want to talk about is called The Tract House, which was a collaboration with Lisa Ann Auerbach. She's a Los Angeles-based artist. And she had this idea of using the idea of a tract, which oftentimes are religious in nature and might be handed to you uh, by a little old lady in the bus or in the street corner, um, using this idea but soliciting other texts, but then presenting it as um, you know, these tracts that people could take uh, from the exhibition and then pass out uh, to their friends. Um, so um, there were two iterations of this, one in Baltimore uh, and another one in Philadelphia, and Lisa asked her friends to just write something, uh, manifestos or rants or poetry, uh, whatever, and then she handed all this over to me and I designed these tracks. And the second one, uh, in De Philadelphia, the subject matter was about Darwin because it was um, Darwin's uh, birthday, I think 200th or death year, I forget. Um, but the, um, so I made a visual identity that was quite, um, yeah, I'd say luscious in terms of typography and colors and harkened back to some 19th century uh, typography and, and image, imagery. I went to the library and scanned a bunch of you know, Victorian uh, kind of woodcuts. Um, these are some of the tracks that I designed. And some of them were quite funny. And I tried to really, I mean, you know, this one came to me as a word file, just one, you know, one paragraph, and I really went into it and, and created hierarchy and pulled things apart and, um, you know, made this, um, you know, convey graphically the message. Couple close-ups. Some of them were quite uh, simple, just small little one-pagers. So you, you only received text? Yeah, I just received text. Which is very common, and, and, and you know, if you tr I'm sometimes trying to explain what do I do if you, you know, tell your parents I'm a graphic designer, I made this book, and then they ask, well, did you write it? No, I didn't write it. Did you take the photos? No, I didn't take the photos. Did you create the typeface? No, I didn't. But everything else, right, deciding which photo goes where and which typeface to choose and, um, you know, this, the dimensions, the page count, etc. that's what graphic designers do. Uh, and, and, and that's the way um, you shape a lot of the meaning, right? and, and, and you have a big impact on the, on the final project. This was actually the very first one that I designed that kind of established a typographic palette. If you find the right typeface, like this, you know, the, the word roach, that typeface is just beautiful, appropriate, because it harkens back to this kind of 19th century wood type, and it does a lot of the work for you. It's all my, I mean, it takes a lot to get to that point, but once you get to the point, you know, these things design themselves in a way. You have the colors, you have somewhat of a grid, you have your typographic palette, and it just comes together. It's almost like cheating. It's not really, and it takes a lot of skill, but it feels like that, like it just happens. But to get to this place, that's, that's quite difficult at times, to make those early decisions. I just found out there might be, they might be shown in Thousand Oaks in the fall, uh, as I know some gallery approached Lisa, so. This, this is still kind of, after seven years, still something that, that can be shown again. Okay, maybe. Sign of the Times, 2010. Cool, and then I'll show you quickly this other project with an artist, um, a collaboration with Fritz Haig. Uh, he used to be in Los Angeles, now he started an artist community up in 
uh, Northern California. Um, and he did this project in 2013 called Wildflowering LA, where he asked the general public, it was an open call, to identify vacant pieces of land that people had access to, either your front yard or you know, the kind of yard at your school that, was, that wasn't really being used for anything, it was kind of a patch of weed, um, and to activate it and sow wildflowering seeds. And he approached me to work on the identity for the project, including these prominent signs that established every single site. And uh, for my visual research, I looked a lot at signage for national parks. So this idea of these, these wooden signs with this, um, this typography that was um, drilled into it with a machine. And eventually designed a schematic of this sign, um, which in the beginning still had three panels and for cost reasons um, was made into two. This was the final schematic that I sent to the wood shop, including, you know, if you look at the typography, it was very important that these drill holes would somehow fall somewhere where it wouldn't impede uh, one of the letters. And um, the know-how shop, this is a woodworking shop in Highland Park, they um, manufactured these. And this looks like it's painted, but it's actually um, oxidized, so it's torched uh, with a flame uh, burner. Um, and we like this uh, technique because it kind of, you know, harkened back maybe a little bit to, to wildfires and how fire plays an important uh, part in, in the ecology. And it's a natural process, and we didn't actually have to pick, you know, a swatch color, you know, what brown do you want? It's like, okay, we'll just torch it and, and get the color that way. It was a more satisfying process. This is the first sign. Uh, the artist actually is right here. That's Fritz. Um, and eventually they were found all over uh, Los Angeles. I think there were a little more than 50 sites, or maybe exactly 50. Um, here's one at Cal State Pomona, I believe. And then in the spring, the wildflowers that were, um, the seeds were, or that were planted in a way, they, they started coming up and there were some quite beautiful sites. But also some sites where nothing happened. It was also one of the really dry years, so it was kind of a little unfortunate, but maybe conceptually also interesting that, you know, in a really dry year, it's really hard for flowers to grow. Okay. Um, a couple more uh, projects I have to show. And the next section um, deals a little bit um, of my interest in, in making images that are based on some kind of procedure, a pre-existing set of rules. Uh, and I have two projects, these two posters that I created. They're a little bit older. Uh, the one on the left is from 2006, and the one on the right is from 2008. Uh, but both of these have images that I created uh, through a very specific pr uh, process. Um, this uh, first one uh, was for a lecture at CalArts, uh, no, not a lecture, a, a reading. So there were students that came to me. I was a student still, and they came to me. We were going to have a reading. We're, we're writers here at the school, and uh, can you make us a poster? And they sent me, um, well, actually, first of all, here's a detail. They sent me this image. They said, we really want to work with this image. Can you do something? At first I thought, oh, that's uh, a difficult image to work with. It was also really small. Um, so I can't just use that and put some type over it and call it a day. So I thought, how could I translate this into something meaningful and interesting? And at the time, I was um, taking a class on coding uh, with the programming language called Python. And I was uh, doing some experiments of you know, manipulating images uh, with code. So I came up with the following scheme. Um, here's some example of, of the code that I wrote. And the theme was, or the scheme that I created was that I would sample um, 
parts of the image, and I would take the RGB value of those. I overlaid a grid in a way, and I sampled the RGB value of each of these dots. All right, so here in this example, uh, red is 120. It's like from, from 0 to 255, right? 120, 160, and 200, and I would translate that into vector circles with a radius that's correlated to that number. So the blue circle is the biggest because it's the biggest number, and then the green and, and then the red in this example. And um, the circle kind of um, design would be different depending on different RGB values. So this one, for example, is one for when red, there's no red uh, in the image, the green is at 120, and the blue is at 255. Um, Etc. Sometimes two values are the same, so then they would overprint. And when you start doing that, with you know enough, you know, depending on the size of your grid, you get these circle constellations. And what I was really excited by this was a process. I didn't know what would happen. I hoped for the best. Uh, what did happen, fortunately, that when you zoom out, you actually start seeing the, uh, the original shape again. It's kind of a ghost image. And it's uh, something that I, um, sorry, uh, that I couldn't have come up any other way um, than to write some code and create imagery that way. Um, so that was really exciting for me, figuring out this. Um, in a way, I made my own filter. Right? It's a filter you might actually, someone might market that in InDesign and then, you know, maybe then it's over because anyone can do it. But at this point, it was my own private filter. Um, and then for, for this uh, poster uh, for the uh, a lecture at USC for um, this art collective called Gorilla Girls, I um, also came up with a structure. I didn't write code, but I came up with a very regimented way of creating this gorilla face. Um, the Gorilla Girls, um, if you don't know, they are an artist collective. Um, I don't know, they might still be active, but they were really active in the 80s uh, and 90s, and they were lamenting the fact um, that there were so few women in, in the art world, and they did um, put up billboards and they did performances and gave lectures and they actually lecture with these gorilla masks. So I went to the lecture and the, the artists, they're all anonymous and they wear a gorilla mask while they lecture to protect their identity. Um, but back to the poster, here's a detail of that um, gorilla face. The first thing I did was create a bunch of patterns that were all based in cyan, yellow and magenta in different ways of overprinting, right? That's where you get green and, and, and red, and, and even you know, something close to black there on the bottom. And the second thing I did was create a circular grid. I just played around with an in, uh, illustrator, you know, a lot of step and repeat, copying circles, until I found something that I felt was interesting enough and put that grid on top of a gorilla that I just you know, found online. And then I started painting in shapes based on the image and the grid. So the grid kind of limited my, the options of what I could do, but it had enough flexibility so I could trace the outline of the, um, of the gorilla so it still would be an ape, or you could recognize it. So this is somewhat in between a little further along. Eventually, I would start making the actual poster because it actually had to say something. In the, um, in the border, I put in all their, the members of the Gorilla Girls, they have pseudonyms of women and art history. So it says Freda Kahlo and uh, Kate Kolvitz, um, et, et cetera. And then eventually, this is the final poster. And you know that type obviously does a lot of aggressive, uh, <laughs> aggressive things and energetic things. Um, something obviously to be aware of that someone needs to still find where this is and be able to read what's happening, right? So um, you know it's pushing it a little bit that it says Gorilla Girls. 
Okay, and I'll finish up with uh, some personal work, uh, one project that is more of an installation or maybe an intervention, and then a bunch of websites that are, um, you know, that are not client work, but personal interests. The first project um, is a, I call it street chess. And it's a chess set that I uh, created for uh, Ciclavia. I don't know if anyone who's from Los Angeles here has been to Ciclavia. These are street festivals. Uh, they happen maybe three times a year. The next one is coming up, I believe, in August. Um, and miles of roadway are closed to bicyclists and pedestrians, uh, which is a really fun way of exploring the city without cars getting in the way. Uh, and at the time, they were uh, giving out small grants to um, people that applied for them, asking to activate the streets. And I'd been interested in, uh, you know, one, playing chess at the time, but also in this idea of playing it in a different scale on the street. And you might have seen this before, this, these giant street sets. Usually they're made of plastic. And I told the Ciclavia people, I'm going to make one um, myself. Um, and I had this crude little these crude little sketches, how I would make them two-dimensionally out of foam boards. Um, and they said yes, and they gave me a little bit of money, and I uh, designed these, these figures that, from a certain perspective, look, you know, quite um, like they have a lot of volume, but they're just, um, you know, two pieces of a cardboard kind of fit together um, in a cross. Um, here's me designing them. I only use straight um, angles, no curves, so I could cut them better with, um, with an X-Acto blade. That's the production. And then I had to do, make a white one and a black one, obviously. It was quite a bit of work. Um, I got a carpet and sprayed uh, white squares on it. Uh, my friend helped me here um, for the board. And then this is, uh, this is actually right around the corner. On my way here, I passed this uh, street corner um, on Hewitt Street. Um, this is the former mayor, Antonio Villagrosa. He's, he was very excited about it. He stopped by on his bicycle. Um, these two knights showed up and played um, for a while. <laughs> They're actually threatening each other, if you know chess. Um, and then I brought it out a few more times at different locations here right by City Hall, and it was always quite exciting to see people kind of engage uh, with the game and, you know, have my, my work be used and people be really excited. Oh, and then one year later I was like, okay, I'm going to make this as a small piece too, and I laser cut these figures out of balsa wood and made a couple of small sets. On to some websites. Um, I'm showing this website not because it's a masterpiece of design, but because it's my first website that I ever coded and designed in 1999 about the painter Edward Munch, who at the time I was quite excited about, um, and still am, uh, his art. Uh, a year later, I refreshed it. Uh, this is still up at edwards-monk.com. Um, I won't touch it. It's like it's an ar historical artifact. Uh, um, yeah, early 2000s web design. This is, though, a website that I recently launched. And again, I, I find it, uh, you know, it might be not all that interesting from like the content for you guys because it's very internal but maybe you uh, enjoy the concept um, of it which it started with the uh, with the fact i was thinking you know i'm coming from a small school maybe this is relatable to sciarc um, coming from a small school there are um, there are about 60 people each year enrolled in the graphic design department at calarts and I know that there are some semi-famous people that came before me, and some of them teach there, but I have very little um, knowledge of when they were there, who were their peers, etc. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a 
kind of a website where every single person that has ever gone to my school is listed and you can kind of do some searches. And that's what I then set out to do. I designed the thing, I coded it, um, thought about the structure, and then what was the most uh, hardest thing actually was to find all the data going back in time. So if you kind of scroll down here, it's fairly straightforward, um, just a listing of every single person um, who's ever um, attended my school. Uh, here, that's me in 2000, and uh, well, four and five here. Um, but you can also start doing some searches. So if I search for myself, then it isolates um, the name that you've searched for. If I add someone, um, maybe a friend of mine who was with me at the time, you know, now I got two names in here, uh, maybe to someone that's more recent, that was my student. There you go, she just graduated. Um, and then there are these different modes where you can isolate the names, not see all the other ones, and or compare them in this uh, kind of vertical way. So, as I said, probably not that interesting to you guys because you don't know any of these, but imagine this was from your high school or from your, 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 your college. Uh, and that's, you know, was my, um, um, motivation uh, to have this system that's, you know, one, kind of easy to use and has some functionality and it's beautiful to look at and it's kind of gives me the opportunity to research certain people and see if they've actually gone to my school. Um, I'll uh, maybe show two more, two more websites before wrapping up. Um, this is a kind of a side project we did at my studio, uh, a website uh, that would uh, randomly pick things from a list. So if you and your friends are like, where are we gonna go for lunch? These are four options, let's just randomize it. Or if you wanna, you know, what music do I wanna listen to? Here are some bands, pick a winner for me. Um, so it's fairly, um, there's some, um, there's some fun here and it's fairly straightforward. So maybe uh, we'll do, see which one is our favorite Beatle. Uh, my name is Roman. So what are their names? John, uh, Ringo, George. What's the last one? Thank you. Okay, so how many winners should you pick? Uh, you know, this is where the fun starts. There's some animal drawings. It's always, always helpful to have animals. Uh, we just want to pick one, um, and then we can... This is actually live at heyrandy.co, C-O. Um, and then it goes through a um, you know, quick animation. It lists all the options. And then picks that one. And the animals you know, celebrate the results uh, enthusiastically. I'll show. Um, here, um, uh, oh. in the about section, here's a demo of, you know, if you wanted to, you know, put in all the bands that you like and figure out which ones do you want to listen to. So there's a lot more options here. We were kind of interested to make it a dramatic or kind of a visually interesting process. There you go. Um, and then lastly, this is a little project I did um, at the end of last year. Uh, I like to make uh, lists of my favorite music of the year and then make a quick website about it and share it with my friends. So uh, we do that as a studio. So Nicole does her picks of her favorite web, uh, music and I do mine. Uh, so you can kind of look at hers. And what's happening here is these are abstract, or yeah, abstractions of the covers. And as you hover over, you can actually, you know, look at each one um, sequentially. And if you, um, you know, click on it, then you get these, um, 
these buttons and it lets you listen to, to the music as well. Um, so, you know, a small example of doing something that isn't necessarily driven by a client, but it satisfies my own interest in, you know, hear music and exploration of, of, um, of web design. Um, and that's it. Thanks for your uh, interest. <laughs> and if, <laughs> thank you. And 1018, if you have any questions right now, I'd be happy to answer them, or we can um, talk, you know, afterwards. Does anyone have any? Yeah, go ahead. That, oh, that's a really good question. That was by myself. And it was hard, meticulous work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if we go back to it real quick. Here, right? Um, maybe here. So you can kind of see um, the grid. And there's this tool in Illustrator which is called the Live Paint Bucket. So that'll fill in any uh, area that is surrounded by paths. So I would just... So that took, um, I don't know if it took days, but it, it was kind of, it took quite a long time. Uh, and it was, and, and you had to make decisions of where to actually, um, um, you know. You can kind of see that there's, like, this is the boundary for one of the, one of the colors. And I made those decisions as I went along. Um, any other questions? One thing I'll say, if, you know, I'll, I'll be, oh, you want to ask something? Uh, I Go ahead. Question, I just have a question. I know that some students are interested in scripting and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what environment do you use for the Python script? And do you have any recommendations about, uh, like, the kind of scripting thing in graphic design? Yeah. Um, to be fair, the Python stuff I did for a while, and I can't say I'm an expert on that. By any means, I got enough to you know do this one poster, and it was like ten years ago. So that's not the programming language that I use anymore. What I use a lot is JavaScript, and I know that you can use JavaScript either in a web environment or on its own to do some image processing as well. I think there's a library called Image Magic that I used in Python too, but you can use it in JavaScript. Um, in general, I would um, you know in terms of you know environments and how to do it, that's um, maybe a little difficult to say in a few minutes. Um, but if you are interested in, in, in coding uh, in this day and age, I would um, encourage anyone to learn more um, and to develop your skills. Because I feel, for me anyway, it's been uh, one really enriching, and it, as you saw, led me at times to solutions that I couldn't have done. Uh, without coding. Obviously, all the web work I do uh, is based on coding, and it gives me the uh, ability to do things myself instead of relying on a developer that might or might not, um, you know, share my sensibilities. Um, and I think there's also a lot of creative um, decision making involved when you write your own code. You know, you can kind of figure stuff out on your own that you can't really figure out when you. Um, when you do mock-ups. Um, but yeah, I think the, the language, the language that I know and that I would recommend people to look into is JavaScript because it's becoming uh, a language. Even it, um, Illustrator has some scripting uh, capabilities. InDesign does too, by the way, and the syntax is, borrows very heavily from uh, that kind of JavaScript um, uh, syntax. Do you, um, what are you using, uh, or are you coding? Um, I think a lot of people in our industry use processing, and then they use a plugin for kind of called Grasshopper. 
Yeah, that's, that's not something I've looked into, but processing is actually very much about image manipulations, right? So that's, that's actually another one that's uh, helpful to look into, but it's not something that I've done before. Any, any other comments or, or questions? All right, then uh, let's take a quick break. What I would say is it's, um, it's 10.20. So at 10.45, let's meet here again and I'll do uh, a lecture about more nuts and bolts things about typography, okay? Thank you. So when talking about typography, maybe one of the first things to start the discussion is, um, you know, how do you classify typefaces? And one of the biggest um, classification schemes there are is the separation into serif type versus sans serif type. Uh, is this something that's generally, that you're familiar with? Maybe, how about hand signals? Who's familiar with these two terms? Looks like even the, counting the reluctant hand holders, maybe half of you. Um, but half of you aren't, I suppose. So let me explain a little bit. Um, the, um, at the, you know, at its most simple, it's basically these little ticks at the feet of the letters, you know, kind of what I've circled there. That's called a serif. And uh, historically, they, they started by, you know, ty you know, putting type into stone and then the end stroke, you know, and you put your, your tools and you, you finish the stroke, it would actually leave a, a horizontal mark as well and that then got formalized into, into typefaces, you know, when, um, when they were created for the printing press. Um, but it also, for these, the left column, um, you know, it kind of creates a, um, a horizontal visual movement on the bottom of the, on the baseline where the letters rest. Um, and historically, they are older um, than the sans serif, so sans Latin without serif, obviously. Um, on the right, um, they started coming into fashion the end of the 19th century. Um, so here are just some examples of typefaces um, that. Um, that belong to these um, categories. Um, there are others though, right? There are script typefaces uh, that kind of hark back to, to handwriting. There are uh, monospace typefaces where each letter has the exact same horizontal space, which makes for awkward moments, uh, here's this example in these three letters, A, I, and M, the I takes up the exact same space as the letter M which you know, forces the I to be quiet, like stretch itself out, and the M you know, looks a little claustrophobic. Um, I feel like I've seen, um, like they are, not, they are not the most readable typefaces for a lot of copy, but they can be, uh, you know, they, they have a certain, you know, obviously if you wanna make something feel like a typewriter wrote it, right? Uh, you would go to those uh, typefaces, but they're also very kind of, um, you know, emotionally neutral oftentimes, and kind of cold. Uh, and that can be helpful if you're looking for a typeface that communicates something more objective. Um, there are these black letter uh, shapes, um, um, you know, there are fonts that are used not even for uh, letters, but for ornaments. In that case, they are not necessarily typography, but they're using the software to um, the software of a font to uh, deliver, you know, other symbols um, or ornaments. And then there are some typefaces like Optima on the very bottom that are a little hard to classify. Right? It kind of seems like a serif because it has this variation of thicks and th thins, but the serifs, actually, the serifs are actually not even there. Uh, so it's kind of uh, bridging the gap. Um, if you look at serif typefaces, there is this, uh, there are broad categories. I'll, I'll go through these quickly. It's kind of an overview. Um, and and they're, it's mostly historical, right? They're the older ones, they're called old style. They go all the way back to the 1400s. Um, and you can kind of see, if you look at the letters 
closely, you can kind of see the, it's constructed by, in a way, the, the trace of a hand is still in there, right? It's kind of idea of writing this with, with a pen, you know, if you look at the, the shape of the A, um, which you kind of start losing um, with the transitional and certainly with these mo modern typefaces where the serifs are just straight lines here for, for the third one, Bodoni. Um, and the letters really seem constructed, you know, geometrically more than actually written. You can also see that, you know, if you drew a line here where, um, uh, sep uh, like, um, where the, um, the angle of the O is, this is actually at an angle where this one is straight up and down. And then uh, the, the last category here, the Egyptians have these really fat, massive serifs in there, you know, maybe from the latter part of the 19th century. Um, and they all carry, you know, if you look at them, they carry different emotional or kind of different, they have different personalities. Um, and that, that is true too for the sand serifs. Uh, you know, there's those that, that feel more constructed by hand, like this first one. They're often called humanist typefaces. Um, the second one is Helvetica, that's kind of in between. Uh, and then there's this category called geometric that basically has been drawn with a compass and you know, the O is almost a complete perfect circle. So how do we, um, you know, talk about um, typefaces in terms of um, fonts and typefaces? Uh, they oftentimes are interchangeably, and this is a bit of terminology, a um, little geeky maybe, uh, but technically you would say Helvetica is a typeface, right? It's not a font, it's a typeface because the font is one subset of Helvetica, so Helvetica bold, condensed, that might be a font of the typeface Helvetica. Um, um, and um, these fonts within, within the typeface, they're, um, they uh, vary, right? Certain typefaces, they have, you know, I don't know, 50 different fonts, and some just have one, like the regular, right? and they might not even have an italic. I mean, you choose one, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, that's something to actually pay attention to. You know, do you have enough variation? Do you have different weights? Do you have the italics? Um, yeah, going into choosing a typeface. Right? That's something that you will have to do for your portfolio book. And I would argue, um, in order to make it something that is quite personal and unique, that might be a choice that has one of the most, um, that's one of the most significant choices you make. You know, you could choose something very neutral and then you'll have a very neutral, you know, typography and maybe you say the emphasis should really be only on the work that you produced. Uh, but since it is a choice that you make, you could kind of figure out, um, you know, what you like, what feels like you know, um, sympathetic to your personality or your outlook of the world. Um, and it's a little hard to say, you know, this typeface embodies my, you know, you know, look at the world, but even if you like it a lot, maybe that's enough to kind of use that and, and, um, and make something that, that feels quite personal. Um, so <laughs> step number one, choosing a typeface. Can anyone identify one of these three fonts? Yes. Yes. That's the first one. No? <laughs> yes. Who said that? Yep. So and then we have one in the middle. It's called Mistral. So my first rule or just suggestion, it's a little heavy handed and maybe, you know, kind of, I say that in the spirit of, you know, having a little bit of fun, you know, try to stay away from committing type crimes. Uh, I mean, people have made whole websites about uh, Comic Sans. This one's called ComicSansCriminal.com, and you can take the Comic Sans pledge, where you say that you understand my choice of font has the power to subconsciously and incorrectly set the tone for a piece of printed material, 
And as a result, promise, I promise to seriously consider whether Comic Sans is an appropriate font. Now, I'm not saying that you know, you're the kind that will you know, choose those, but if you go around and look in the world, there's all kinds, I mean, this website, by the way, has like police notices set in, in Comic Sans, right? Uh, you'll see it at any, any office party, will have some kind of sign that you know, the office system thought that font was really fun and friendly. Uh, but if you look closely, it's, you know, it's just kind of you know, not even a font, you know, it's just like really crude. Um, so I would say that these are the ones that people like, like to pick before they have any idea of typography and, um, you know, kind of get them into aesthetic troubles. So, um, you know, it's kind of broad, but, you know, I just wanted to say that. Um, secondly, anyone... Can anyone ID any of these? Which one? First one, Times New Roman. Second one? Okay, Ariel wins out, yes. Close to Helvetica, knockoff. And then the last one, a little harder maybe? Should seem familiar. Who? No. I like, though, that you have all these fonts. I mean, you obviously have been looking at some like that. Tahoma. No. I mean, if you look closely, it has these, these, these rounded, you know, where Helvetica is very, I mean, it's a little hard on the screen, but it's very straight. It's like these little rounded, like um, It's the default font for um, Office uh, called Calibri. There's a couple of default fonts. They all start with a C. Um, there's a serif too, can't re uh, think of it right now. Um, they are actually um, fairly well-designed uh, typefaces. Arial, you could you know, have a debate about. Uh, I could have put Helvetica in there as well. Um, but they are the defaults in a way, right? Times New Roman, when you open up earlier Office documents or Word documents, it would be start in Times New Roman. Everyone would use it. You probably wrote some essays in Times New Roman because your teacher told you to. Um, you know, I think nowadays Calibri might be uh, um, a preset for many things that are written. And they are, you know, for kind of the lay person, fine typefaces, right? You don't embarrass yourself with it. But it's also, you know, everyone's using them, right? So it kind of says nothing at this point. Um, so, you know, try to avoid them. Um, secondly, just the more technical question. Are there enough weights and styles? This is a typeface called Univer, uh, I think designed in the 50s. One of the first super fonts, super typefaces, that goes all the way from the upper right from a condensed light version to the lower left, a fat extended version with the uh, regular somewhere in the middle. So when you when you look at your typeface that you're thinking of choosing, see if there's at least a regular, an italic, a bold, and a bold italic. Because um, if they aren't, here's a typeface. That's nice, I like it a lot. If you remember closely, this is actually the typeface I used for the presentation earlier. Um, you know, it has a lot of, I don't know, has personality, it's a little edgy. You know, if you look at the S, it almost has a little tooth little sharp. There's, you know, there's some kind of strength in that, uh, but in a friendly, fun way. Uh, but it has no italics. The font, the typeface doesn't come with a font for italics. So if you set a lot of stuff in italics, you might not. But if you do, um, you know, it might not be an appropriate typeface. So look at that. Sometimes you can only get your hands on a free version of you know, the regular and the italics and the bolts, et cetera, you have to buy, um, which is another whole other issue. You know, how do you even get typefaces? I'll talk about in a second. Um, then lastly, I want to talk about maybe the most, well, the most kind of hard, the hardest thing to quantify, but the idea of um, the personality of a typeface. Right? And is it appropriate? And you can take that any, any which way. You can talk about the history of the typeface, um, you know, the time period, 
the feeling it invokes, um, you know, does it feel like a Western or does it feel like a futuristic typeface? Does it feel like a futuristic typeface, but one that was made in the 60s, so a future that maybe never happened? Um, this is from a book called Stop Stealing Sheep uh, by Eric Speakerman, also a type designer. Um, and in it is this one page that asks you to, you know, line up these shoes with typefaces. Um, and maybe, you know, this kind of boot works pretty well with this Western looking typeface. And maybe this sneaker here looks kind of like Cooper Black. Maybe this looks like this kind of college campus typeface face. And um, Snell Round Hands down here maybe works with these shoes. So you kind of see that these personalities, um, you know, these are heavy handed examples. And you probably, hopefully, will not use any of these typefaces. But sometimes you have to kind of look at you know, more extreme examples to, um, to kind of make a point. By the way, if you're interested in typography, I would highly recommend this book. Uh, it's a nice primer for uh, you kind of a general audience even. It, for designers, but it reads really well. It's a lot of illustrations, a lot of um, fun metaphors. A lot of metaphors in that book, like, like this. Shoes. Oh, also of note, here on the lower right, it says, in some cases, it's very easy to spot a typographic faux pas. All right, so that typeface as a stop sign does not work all that well. It's not assertive enough. Anyway, looking back at some of these, you could start making some assumptions, right? Maybe Gehrman kind of feels a little older Bodoni has a certain class to it. You know, these kind of modern typefaces are often used in fashion. Uh, Clarendon is very sturdy, almost a little heavy-handed. Uh, maybe looks a little Western. Uh, Quadrat, again, you know, more, more friendly. Uh, maybe a little older. Um, prestige, kind of a fancy but monospace, monospace typeface. Uh, kind of has, kind of, um, you know, it's a lot of rigor, but it's also um, you know, kind of fashionable, maybe. Um, foundry form serif, if you look at it, they're condensed slightly. So the, the, the horizontal space for each letter is less than in other typefaces. You know, Helvetica, maybe the most neutral of them all. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Meta, more friendly. Futura, kind of very symmetrical. Uh, but also quite beautiful, et cetera. You can, Brian maybe is a little bit more, uh, um, what do you say, um, you know, maybe techy, but in a friendly way. Stratum has a lot of grit. So like looking at them and kind of figuring out what does it communicate subconsciously um, is your task in a way. And then something that you like, that you feel, you know, it embodies your, um, either your, your, your professional design sensibilities or just your personality. Um, so the personality of a typeface is something to consider. Um, and then this question, right? Um, Emmett, I think you've mentioned Helvetica in class, right? And Okay, so here I am to tell you, don't do it. <laughs> or at least I'll make a good argument. Here are some things about it. It's a really well-designed font typeface, and the most famous. So it's really hard to embarrass yourself with Helvetica. You won't, right? So that's good. So in some sense, if you don't know what to do, that's a good typeface to start out with, right? Um, it actually looks quite good for headlines. There's a lot of kind of beautiful negative space in the letters, and they kind of hold together really well. Um, but it's, I would argue, not that great for a lot of running text. Like this kind of, that negative, it starts to look, it doesn't look very organic. It doesn't look like, it doesn't have a lot of the kind of trace from a hand gesture that other typefaces have. Um, so it feels a bit rigid in a lot of a body copy. And then lastly, you know, yeah, go ahead. 
This typeface is called accurate. Um, this, right, this, the black type. Um, it's a Dutch version of a typeface called Accidents Grotesque, which is one of the um, oldest sans serifs from, I don't know, 1890s, I want to say. Um, If you, um, so, so the, my question is, can you find something more unexpected, right? If everyone uses the same typeface, then, you know, things will look, you know, not your work. Your work will always be your work. But, you know, when you do something printed and you communicate something with typography, that adds a lot of personality to a piece of printed um, uh, matter. So, you know, can you find something more unexpected? That would be my challenge. One thing I'll do say, though, if you want to see a movie about graphic design, then see this movie. It's on Netflix. It's, I don't know, an hour and a half, and it does a few things. It talks about this typeface heavily, but it also is a, a historical drama, in a way, of graphic design from the 50s into the early 2000s. Has anyone seen this film? Maybe a few? So, um, if you want to know more about graphic design, see this movie. Uh, it's beautifully made, too. It's great, great music, and you will get to meet a lot of contemporary graphic designers and a few design legends. Um, all right, then moving on to finding typefaces. Uh, that's obviously an issue, right? It's an issue in terms of legal terms, in terms of monetary expenditures. Um, the nice thing is if you have a subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud, which I assume you have since you're all working with InDesign, I don't know how you got that piece of software, but if you got that legally through the Adobe Cloud, you have a subscription to Typekit, which lets you sync thousands of typefaces to your, uh, to your desktop computer and you are able to use them legally. Um, if you do web work, Typekit also has a lot of web font um, capabilities. But in, for our um, concern here, um, you can just browse their font library and download them to your computer through the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud. So if you have that, that's really nice. Um, on the fr you can obviously also go to Type Foundries and spend $600 and get a really fancy font. Um, you can also, you know, ask your friend, maybe they have a typeface and you get it that way. Um, you know, keeping in mind the, um, the legal and, um, you know, ethical ramifications. Um, there are some nice free fonts out there. Google Fonts, uh, you can download all of these and install them on your system. I think Google Fonts is mostly used for web typography, but some of these typefaces, you know, are fine to use. I would, you know, there's a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff that wouldn't be appropriate, so you have to be kind of discerning. Um, there's a couple others, like there's thefont.com uh, that has a bunch of free fonts. Uh, sometimes you'd only get a few styles um, and then have to buy the rest. But maybe, you know, a bold and a Roman and an italic um, is enough for your purposes. Here's another one called Font Scroll. But what you also shouldn't do is spend the next four days looking for the perfect typeface, right? That's, <laughs> that's the caveat. Um, there are a lot. Um, a little bit more technical stuff, you know, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but it might be helpful to be able to talk about certain things. So this is some anatomy. Uh, the, the terms in red are the ones that I think are, are helpful for um, our purposes. So the letters all stand on something called a baseline. Um, the height of the smaller 
um, the small letters, the lowercase letters, is called the X sides. And you'll often hear people talk about a certain kind of, you know, it has a large X side or small X sides. And that's the ratio of the X side to the capital letters. In this case, you know, it's fairly large. It's maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 percent. There are certain typefaces, older typefaces, where the lowercase letters are quite much smaller than the capitals. And that impedes or has ramifications for readability on the page. Um, you know, descenders are the parts of certain letters that go beyond, uh, beyond uh, below the baseline. Ascenders are the parts of letters that go above the X sides. And you only have those for lowercase letters. I guess the Q, the uppercase Q, might have a descender, kind of swoops down. Sometimes the J does too. Something about upper and lowercase, um, kind of just in terms of visual perception, this might um, might be a reason why you don't set running or body copy in all uppercase letters. It's just harder to read because just visually, if you compare that, since uppercase characters just form a straight box, there are no ascenders and descenders, it's just harder to perceive. You know, the way we read, we look at a word, we don't read every single letter, we just see it as a shape and we read the word, right, if you're good at reading anyway. Um, that is a lot harder to do when all you see is uh, you know, rectangular boxes versus here on the left, more irregular shaped. Um, shapes. But that's, you know, for a headline, you know, maybe one sentence, all uppercase, is a nice, a nice way to add contrast, but um, not ideal for, um, for a lot of copy, for a lot of text. And, you know, some tab faces only have um, all uppercase characters. And, and in fact, the Marciano website, the very first project I showed you, the primary typeface that was established for their identity is a typeface that only has uppercase letters. Um, so when we started you know, developing a typographic palette for um, the website, we realized we need a secondary sans serif typeface for smaller captions or you know, kind of um, for applications where we needed an upper and lower case. It gets kind of oppressive. I mean, if you've ever had an email sent to you in all caps, it's kind of like someone's yelling at you, right? Anyway, uh, there's some designers, little historical aside. Um, what's his name? Herbert, Herbert Bayer. Um, he was at the Bauhaus, a student, later taught there in the 30s and 40s. Um, he thought to get away, uh, to, to, to create an alphabet that is a unicase alphabet that includes uppercase letters and lowercase letters and get, you know, kind of uh, end this whole uppercase, lowercase uh, situation, which for a German typographer is quite radical because in German you capitalize every single noun, so there's a lot of capitals. So he said, no more, only one didn't quite go anywhere, although, you know, philosoph uh, Philosophia on the bottom has a unicase. That's a more recent typeface, I think, from the late 80s. Um, it's kind of an interesting take. But again, historical aside, cur curiosity. Um, let's talk about some type properties and talk about how they are controlled by these two palettes in InDesign which you hopefully have gotten to know by now, uh, the character palettes and the paragraph palettes. The character palette dealing mostly with individual letters um, and the paragraph palette dealing with an entire paragraph. So influencing the spacing before and after a paragraph or indents or the um, justification for the paragraph palettes. And then things like the size and the letting um, the tracking, et cetera, for the character palette. So what are these uh, type properties? Uh, let's start with size, right? It's easy. Measured in points, you might have noticed that. Why points? Historical 
artifact in a way, one point is one th uh, seventy second of an inch. Um, that's just points and pica used used to be the, you know, when type was still set by hand, uh, or even in photo uh, typesetting. Those are um, the units that were used. We still use points. I don't know. I don't use pica as a designer. There might be designers around. I don't didn't study that in school. Uh, pica. What is it? Twelve points is a pica or something. Um, but we still specify type sizes and points. Right? Everyone does. Even Microsoft Word uses points as the measurement. Um, and you know, in the character palette, it's after you choose your typeface and the font, it's actually the first box there. Um, in general, I would say six points to 16 points is a good body size. Uh, the best range is probably between nine and 11. If you just have like a caption uh, or you know a paragraph, yes. Um, it's actually the measurement of the A sender, so that's probably the cap height, and the D sender, right? I probably so it actually measures all the way from down here, from the Y to like the top of the S, so the tallest and the lowest thing. You know, the, the problem with making type too small is obviously that it's unreadable. The problem with making type too big is that it gets kind of horsey on the page. It looks kind of clunky and somewhat unsophisticated. Unless you, and I've showed some examples in my own work, unless you go overboard and make type so big that you only fit you know, 10 words on a page, then you could argue it's you know, kind of purposeful and can be kind of a cool effect. Here's something about perceived sizes, and the X height comes back into play. These four typefaces are all set in um, with 72 points. But if you look at them, Helvetica uh, it looks a lot bigger than Linoscript. Right? And that has to do with the fact that the X height for Linoscript, well, I don't know, in percentage, it's maybe 35%. So in order to make something legible in Linoscript, you'd have to use a larger typeface, a larger size. In general, too, uh, more contemporary typefaces usually have a higher X, X height compared to the capitals. So this Mrs. Eve, although it's not a very old typeface, it was designed in the late 80s, um, but it harkens back to older um, typefaces. And I think in this case, um, I think it's Garamond. So here, I just put in the, the lines to uh, make the point here. Um, this is more something, well, two things. Some people think it's cool or okay to just drag type. And if you, you know, some of the worst pieces of graphic design by people that, you know, don't, um, either don't care or don't have the aesthetic sensibility is to just stretch type. You know, I need to fit this word into this, you know, I'll just squeeze it or I'll extend it. And you can do that easily um, in a graphical program, right? Uh, but it doesn't look all that great. If you need an extended typeface, then choose an extended font, right? So in, in the case of Helvetica, it has an extended font and a condensed font. The problem here is that when you extend something, the um, vertical strokes get thicker than the horizontal. So for this E, right, this stroke kind of gets out of proportion with the uh, horizontal stroke. Um, and vice versa for the scaling. Sometimes, though, that happens by accident. So in your type palette, if, you know, make sure that those two values there are at 100%. Um, sometimes by just moving things around or uh, you know, making something smaller, 
um, it happens to me as well. Um, and it's hard to, you know, sometimes it's, it's, um, it's hard to um, know what's going on. Something seems off, but check those two values. They should be at 100%. And talking about letting, letting is a term obviously from, not obviously, but it is uh, from the earlier days of printing when people used a piece of lead to space type, uh, metal type. Um, and it's the space, um, the vertical space between lines of type, and you, um, you talk about it as, in, in this case, it's 16 over 20, that's the terminology. So the type size is 16, the letting is 20, uh, which results in there being a four point space between the lines. Not quite sure. I mean, as I was preparing for this lecture, I was saying, wondering, why did you just say the letting is four? You know, I don't know. Um, but that's but that's how you know typographers talk about it, and that's how um, InDesign works. Right? Um, here are some examples of what that means in practice. If you have negative letting, so 16 over 12 you see that letters will start running into each other, the A senders and the D senders. Um, the one in the middle, 16 over 16, they just touch at times um, because there's no space between the, the lines. But it, you know, it looks like there is space because you do have the A sender and D senders and most letters don't actually have A senders and D senders. Um, let's see if there's a moment when they actually touch in this example. I don't see one. Um, and then the one on the right is something, you know, with a little bit more uh, spacious letting. 100%, uh, which is actually the auto uh, setting in most applications. That's why 16 over 19 and a half, if you just use the default, um, then 120% uh, letting is the, uh, will be applied. There's actually a lot of, um, finer moves you can do via the letting. If you want something to have a much denser texture, you take the letting out a little bit, so you reduce it. If you want to feel, have something feel airy and more luxurious, uh, you can add letting. Um, but it also has implications for reading, right? If you have a lot of copy, which maybe in your case for the portfolio book you don't, but if you're setting an article in a magazine and it has really, really dense letting, then it's going to start to feel really oppressive for the reader and vice versa. If the letting is really loose, it feels kind of laborsome to kind of be skipping, you know, but your eye has to travel further to get to the next line. Um, okay, moving on to something called tracking, also called letter spacing, right? That's the spacing between all letters. And again, you can shift the way a typeface appears. You can make it more open, right? Add letter spacing. You can, you know, leave it be, or you can have negative letter spacing, uh, um, negative letter spacing, negative tracking, uh, where there's a bit of claustrophobia, like little edginess um, that starts happening. And the control in InDesign is this um, fourth field. Um, and if you add positive numbers there, you know, you add letter spacing and you take letter spacings away by putting in negative numbers. Quickly about line length. This is actually not something that is related to a paragraph or character palette, but it's just something you know, you, how long is your text box? That's basically that, um, what determines the line length. But it has some real implications. Right? If you look at the first one, that's not fun to read. Right? It's, it's 15 characters per line. Uh, certain words barely make it in there. Uh, 35 characters per line, the middle one that starts to be a little better. Generally, it is said between 40 and 70 is a good rule of thumb. So if you're unsure how long your line length is, and I've certainly seen this, you might have seen this. This is ridiculous. Right? If you're, uh, 
If you're trying to read that, you're going to start to get quite tiring, especially since when your eyes are at the end of the line, you're not going to find the next line when you move back over to the left. Right? That's kind of the biggest problem with line lengths that are too long. Um, so if you're unsure of what to do, just count one, the letters of one line. And if it's between 40 and 70, then you know you're probably OK. These things, though, are all interrelated. To make something like this work, you just add some letting. You space out the, um, you add uh, space in between the lines of type, vertical space. And it gets a little bit easier to read, because when your eye goes back from the right to the left, you know, there's enough space between the lines for you to not lose your, your space. Um, you know, obviously there is our alignment options, and now we're moving on to the character, uh, no, the paragraph palette. Um, left centered, flush right, and justified. One thing I'll say, because uh, that I feel is a move that a lot of people early on do, there's no real reason for many, for most applications to use justified text. Um, you know, we're comfortable reading that in a novel and a newspaper, but anything, you know, that has smaller pieces of, of type, you know, maybe a couple of columns or a caption, there's no reason to justify it. And I see for a lot of people starting out that being like a default, like me justify it, it makes a nice box, right? And I'm comfortable with that versus, you know, this having actually, It creates a lot more visual noise in a way, a lot more attention. But it also lets the text be, you know. The, the problem with justified text is it's like putting on a corset, you know. It's like I'm forcing the text to be left aligned and right aligned at the same time, which results, something has to give, it results in spaces between the words that are, sometimes aren't all that um, beautiful. So my recommendation is, you know, stay away from it. Uh, and don't justify. Um, in the paragraph palette, there are those, um, those buttons that uh, change the justification. You might wonder what the last four do. They all justify the text, but they do something different with the last line. Right? You could either justify all text and the last line is left aligned, or it's centered, or it's right aligned, or the last line is also justified, which results in even crazier type. Because, um, well, this is not a good example, but if you only have two words on the last line, then those are also justified, so you get a giant space um, in, in the middle of the two words. Um, you know, this is starting to get into real finesse typography, which, you know, might be a little much, uh, but I'll mention it to tell you what I pay attention to in my work, right, as a typographer. Um, when I send something, before I send something to print, um, I'll look at the text drags. So, you know, does it make real ugly shapes, like in the middle, like where, you know, it seems like someone took a bite out of the text? Is it kind of timid, like the very right one, not that visually interesting? Or does it have a nice, even kind of in and out, um, kind of a nice rhythm on the right side? The um, question is, how do you affect that? Uh, it's, you know, it's like changing the, the tracking a little bit or bringing one word to the next line, um, changing, yeah, those are the kind of options you have. Again, might be a little bit much for what you are doing, you know, to kind of go into that much detail, but I wanted to mention it. Um, question about widows, you know, this lonely word all by itself on the last line. It's generally frowned, about, frowned about, upon. It's just awkward, right? It's just, sometimes it's just a two letter word and it's just hanging out there all alone. So it's better to push, in this case, you know, the second to last word onto the next line. The best way to do that, by the way, and this is kind of an expert, expert tip, is to put a non-breaking space between the last two words. If you go to your type menu and say insert special character, you'll find somewhere a non-breaking space. 
And that'll make sure that those two words um, will be together and will both move down to the last line. Um, for certain words, if they're really long, like in this example, it might be okay. It's only one word, but it kind of is so long that it doesn't look awkward. So it's not a, ha uh, a you know, kind of a really rigid rule. It's just whenever it looks awkward, then do something about it. Um, here's another expert kind of thing. There are controls called uh, justification and hyphenation that if you have something justified, you can control the text to make the word spacing a little bit more even. If you look at this very first, um, very first column, the hyphenation is turned off and the justification settings are not ideal. So you get this, right? This giant space here versus other lines that have no space, barely any space between the words. So it looks kind of like a Swiss cheese if you look at the texture. Not ideal. You're kind of aiming for something more even. Um, here, the hyphenation is turned on, but the, the uh, justification settings aren't quite effective. And then the last one you know, has a bit more even. Those are the uh, controls that you, um, that you have from InDesign, right? There's in the paragraph palette, you have a hyphenation box. And then if you go to that little flyout menu in the top right, there are all kinds of options. One is justification. And there you can tell InDesign what you want, the word spacing, letter spacing, even glyph scaling where InDesign, this is kind of a type crime that no one knows about. InDesign maybe shifts, like squeezes certain, certain lines just a little bit up to, in this case, 98% and expands it to 102, which no one will be able to see. Uh, but it, 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 it makes the word spacing a little bit more even. So, you know, some typographers would be offended. To, to use glyph scaling. I'm, I'm not that much of a purist, I suppose. Um, again, this is kind of quite expert-y territory. Um, but this isn't. How do you indicate a no new paragraph, right? Generally, there are two ways, um, or two main ways. You either do an indent, and, or you leave some space. Couple things to that. Um, if you do an indent, um, oftentimes it's not necessary to indent the very first paragraph, especially if that aligns to some kind of headline. So, you know, maybe you just, you don't do it for the first paragraph, but you do it for the rest. If you do a space, it's oftentimes not ideal to just put a, another return into your text but to use your um, paragraph panel right here. You just say, add a space after a paragraph. And if you, if you look closely here, this is not a, comp this is not a, um, the space isn't equal to one full line. It's like 70%. If you add a whole line, the kind of, the paragraphs don't seem to visually relate too well to, together. Um, so if you put it to 70% of the, the leading, then it feels a little bit uh, like held together. Yes? You mean uh, a baseline grid or? Yes, it will. Okay, so um, using a baseline grid comes, it's kind of nice because everything kind of locks into place, but that will screw it up. So either you don't leave space after paragraphs um, and you use the indentation method, or you don't use a baseline grid. Um, or sometimes you can do something where you have a baseline grid and you know, every third line hits it you know, for captions that are smaller or for, for this case. So it's kind of... So there's a relationship between the space after the paragraph and the letting that's like one to, or two to three or something, so eventually it'll hit it again. I gotta say, I, the, 
Everything Loose the Land catalog um, about the art, artists and architects from the 70s, there we used a fairly rigid um, baseline grid. But I got to say in my own word, the kind of vertical alignments of things, I'm less fussy about than the horizontal alignments. Like the column structure seems to be much more important than you know, where things fall um, on the vertical alignment. Okay, um, so I don't use baseline grips all that much. A couple more um, odds and ends. Dashes. You can usually tell if something was set by someone who studied typography or not just by the way they treat their dashes. And it's kind of, in a way, nerdy a bit, if you will. But um, I'm sure there are architectural things that everyone know, that is in the know does and people that aren't um, don't know about. Um, so there's three dashes and they have different meanings, right? A regular dash you would use for hyphenation um, and to um, kind of, for these hyphenated words. An N dash usually means uh, time periods, so from five to seven, that needs an N, N dash. And you can go to type, insert special character, dashes, and then you will find these. Just type a dash. Yes, there's also, a, say that again? And then you have two dashes. No. <laughs> yes, yes, very much. In Word, for example, if you do two dashes, Word itself will, I think, has a method to, oh, you want to do like a special dash and it automatically transfers them or changes them. Um, but no, double dashes. Um, some people like writers, I think, use double dashes in manuscripts because they adhere to some ancient you know, rules and manuals, but. Um, I think it's like using underline for a tab. Like, is it a typewriter doesn't have an italic font? So that's where it comes from. Italic, but, you know, because a typewriter doesn't have an M dash, so we put two dashes. Exactly. Dash. And somehow they never caught up. <laughs> And that's something in my work when I get manuscripts from writers um, and editors, that's the first thing I'll have to do, right? Normalize the dashes. Yeah. Which is a hard thing. A dash. Just normalize something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not to my knowledge. There's, there's three. Oh. My understanding is then you use an N dash. Yeah. 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 There are compound nouns where uh, I can't come up with an example, but where, where you actually use an N dash because you're combining a word that belongs to a compound word together. Um, but anyway, um, lastly, the M dash is to kind of make a break, right? And, the styles differ. In the newspaper, the LA Times, for example, they use M dashes, but they put spaces before and after. That's technically not necessary. Some people use an N dash in that case, but use spaces. Uh, so that's kind of up to you. You just have to be consistent. Um, yeah, geeky stuff. Um, continuing with that, right? It's just like if you put a quotation mark, and this will happen automatically because InDesign will say, oh, this is a quotation mark, so I'll you know, use the quotation symbol. But if you use it for inches, right, it's technically incorrect. It needs to be this straight. And the other way around, too, they're called dumb quotes oftentimes. You wouldn't use them for you know, quotes around um, a word. And here is a pet peeve of mine. Um, you know, 
it's, it continues to be a thing to put two spaces after a sentence. I talked to my students before, and maybe you have similar experiences, where teachers, English teachers, will actually requ require that. So it's like a sentence you have. If you look at any kind of magazine or novel or any kind of you know, graphic design that's done by a graphic designer, you'll find that. You'll never find that. Right? But somehow, in popular culture, that's still a thing. And it just leaves an ugly gap. Yesterday, I actually got a letter from my senator, Kamala Harris. You know, and I agreed with her thing, her position. But you know, it's like, really? <laughs> Two spaces after a period? Unbelievable. <laughs> So I don't know where that's from. I think also from the typewriter um, and in certain, you know, when you hand in a manuscript in certain, like, I don't know, um, screenwriting, you might be forced to do it. But in general, that's not something you should be doing. OK, lastly, now, talked about type, some technical stuff, we went into the weeds quite a bit. Uh, let's talk about some more practical things. Um, things that have typographic contrast, because that's, or typographic hierarchy, in fact, because um, that's what you're trying to do in your portfolio books. Um, and the way hierarchy is created is by creating focal points, right? Where does your eye go first, right? That's a focal point. There are multiples, like maybe there's a primary focal point and then a couple secondary, et cetera. Uh, and focal points are in turn created by contrasts, like contrast in you know something small versus something big, something that's black and white and something that's colorful, something that's thin versus something that's thick. Um, probably something I don't know if that's those terminologies pertain to architectural um, things where you you know can. Um, create designs that, that have these kind of you know, contrasts and focal points. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but here's just a small example of you know, why, in the first example, is our eye drawn to that big black square? Well, because it's the biggest thing. It's a contrast and scale. Maybe the second thing we'll see is the small square in the upper left. And then we might see all the other ones. Right? Same with the contrast and weight in the uh, second example. Right, where does our eye go first? It, it's, almost like, it's almost like magic, right? And that's what visual artists and designers, you know, that's their toolkits. You know, they can lead your eye around the page exactly how they want. Magicians. You know, contrast in color. Can you somehow not see that red square in the third example? It's like, it's almost oppressive that your eye keeps going back there even if you want to explore other areas. So for type done, I've identified these, like if, these properties. If you're asking yourself, what can I actually do? I have a piece of type here, or maybe three pieces of type. What are the things I can influence to create hierarchy? And um, this might not be all. These are the ones that I find the most important. White space, scale, weight, style, typeface, color, background color, rules, and underlines, you know, uppercase versus lowercase, indents, letting, tracking, and direction. So maybe for um, you going on to work on your portfolio books, you can use this list, put it next to your desk, and when you kind of run into a situation where I don't know what to do, um, look at it and pick something or get inspired. Well, maybe I can use a different weight on this typeface, make you know, the headline really bold and the you know, caption really light. Um, maybe I can do something with color. Um, maybe I can use an, an underline or some kind of typographic rule, just a line. And in order to illustrate that, I used um, the information, just the typographic information anyway, of uh, one of the previous year's um, portfolio books. And I just played this out a little bit so we can go through it and see what's at work um, and why, why is hierarchy created. Uh, got our list there on the right. And in this first example, it's really just white space. 
right? Line length, you could say, which I you know, don't even have on this list, but it's mostly white space. Even line length really works with white space, right? There's more white space next to this paragraph versus the other one. That's why it feels kind of, like it feels different. And it's very clear that the first thing is the headline, and then there's two paragraphs. Maybe the last thing is a caption, and the first thing is some kind of explanationary, explanatory uh, paragraph um, explaining the technique. It's actually two paragraphs in the second piece of text. Right? It's not indicated very well because it's like kind of the most basic, um, the most basic means here, just using white space. Um, if we don't use much white space, then we can use weight and style. Right? The first, uh, the headline is now bold. And the caption on the bottom is, is italic. And you kind of still have some sense of hierarchy. It's not great design, right? Um, or what is that? It's not very exciting, right? But it kind of gets the job done. Just like this kind of gets the job done. And if you look at certain designs, book designs from uh, the 50s, kind of Swiss-inspired uh, international style, I mean, I think that's, you know, it's an architectural term as well, right? Uh, that also happened in graphic design, and this idea of you know, using the most minimal means to create, um, to create um, hierarchy. Uh, you might you might find a, a book page that looks like this: right? no scale, nothing, just some white space, and it can be kind of beautiful, not overly exciting, but kind of refined and beautiful. Um, then going on, you know, more things start to happen. We're using uppercase for the headline now, putting some tracking or letter spacing. Kind of feel a little bit more spacious, those letters uh, on the top. Using scale, finally. Right? Headline is bigger than the explanatory text and the caption. Um, also, using some leading on the bottom, right? If you, you know, obviously there are different sizes, but if you, if you look closely, the ratio of the leading for the second piece of text, or the third piece of text, seems larger, like it seems more open than the leading of the secondary text, or the second text. Going further, now there's some indentations. So there's some kind of grid lines happening. The headline aligns with the indented text, and that aligns with the caption on the bottom. But then the main piece of text also is allowed to um, go to the left a little bit to kind of seems to pull a little bit to its, to the, to its the left, creating some tension, some visual excitement. Um, but again, if you look at it, it's very clear. There's three things on the page, right? Three pieces of text. In a way, um, you know, and that's also the way we perceive things. In a way, there is probably over 100 letters on the page. But, but when we glance at it, we see three things. We see a headline, maybe three and a half, because these two paragraphs, right? Headline, that text, and some kind of caption. And notice the caption is also in a bold type, right? Kind of equ the the main text is bigger, but but in thin or maybe regular, and the the caption is smaller but bold, which then relates to the bold of the headline again. So there's some kind of communication visually. Um, and then you know always in terms of spacing, um, you know you could say this space right here is maybe three times that space. So using those kind of rational ways of creating a page, um, you know, like ra uh, ratios like one to three or one to four or one and, and two um, can be helpful. Maybe this, I don't know if this is how it happens, uh, but it kind of looks like this space might be, if this is one unit, then this is two units and this is um, six units, right? And then on the bottom, maybe you have, have three units. 
And you know, I did this more intuitively, but if I wanted to now, since I'm starting to realize this, go back and adjust the, um, the values of all those spaces and an underlying kind of grid, you can't go wrong with that. And especially if you use things like one, two, three, that is kind of inherently kind of interesting. And then this happens. Uh, just because the headline isn't first on the page doesn't mean it's not the first thing in the hierarchy. And if it has enough scale and weight in this case, as in this case, it's the first thing you'll see or look at. Or it's at least, it's very clear that that is the headline, right? And that is not the caption. And you can turn things on its side, right? So this is the first time we're using some kind of contrast of direction. Adding color. And here you'll notice, obviously, the headline is, um, is in, um, in the red color. But there's something else that happened that now when you glance at this, it seems that there's kind of four Things yes. Letting is the space between. Letting is the space between um, lines of type. Um, there's a, a thing that happens here that makes you know yet another focal point, which is the word technique, um, being in red too. It's thinner than the other, uh, the rest of the copy there, but it's also in red. And notice the m dash too. So far, it's always been some kind of colon. But it's kind of much more, I don't know, it's fancier. Visually more satisfying to me anyway to just make this kind of stronger gesture of the dash. Um, this um, now adds some rules, right? And those rules can be, or underlines, they can be solid. InDesign has these fun rules of you know, like these dashes, wavy lines. Um, this is a vertical or, or diagonal dash. You can have vertical dashes. Um, sometimes I feel like, I mean, it's, it's also like these trends come and go, but there was a time maybe 10 years ago where that was like a go-to trick. Put like a diagonal dash underline over bold bold uppercase headline and it's like instant contemporary feels fresh you know it's like a it's like a cheap trick um notice also that now we have different typefaces i think that's just happened right uh we have a monospace typeface for the caption uh that has a very kind of regular texture um and a serif typeface for the main copy body copy Keeping and and even this one, right? The technique almost is a bit of a. It's it feels scripty. So four typefaces on one page, right? There are you know there are all kinds of rules people make. The modernists from the 50s will say we'll use one typeface, preferably Helvetica or Univer. Uh, you know the kind of postmodernists of the 90s would use 50, and you know make half of it illegible. Um, but there's no kind of ha fast rules. And I'd say if you have control over your typefaces, using three or four can be nice. Um, if you feel like you don't have control, then you know, pairing it back would be a good beginning. But using two, you know, a serif and a sans serif that work well together might be good starting points. Then you can make the captions in one typeface. Um, and, your, and maybe the captions and the, the um, headlines are the same and your body copy, as in this um, example, is um, a serif typeface. There's this, well, it's maybe a rule, I don't know, maybe it's a myth, but some people say, if you look at the bookstore and look at the typefaces that are used for novels, um, you'll be hard pressed to find a sans serif typeface anywhere for anything that's like continuous reading. So there's this um, rule or this acknowledgement that serif typefaces for lots of text are easier to read. 
some typographers though say that we read best what we read most. So, um, but even then, we read books, you know, novels, lots of type. We mostly read serif typefaces, so might as well. And remember, serifs are the little ticks on the uh, ends of the strokes. Uh, and this is the last one. Um, you know, using background color. And this is kind of using all of it, right? Using white space, scale, weight, style, typeface, color, background color, rules, uppercase, indents, letting, tracking, direction. Um, while, you know, still, you know, I didn't spend, you know, days contemplating these designs, right? I put them together pretty quickly. But I'd argue that it's visually pleasing, probably over the top, right? So, um, just a little bit too much going on, but kind of works. Some of it may be a little forced, like this technique is the same space as this, as if it tries to, it's like a Tetrix game. So, um, so um, actually this concludes that lecture. Um, again, it might be helpful for you to print this out tape it on your desk, and kind of just see, uh, just be reminded of these. This is in your toolkit. These are the things you can, um, you can change when you're working on uh, typographic hierarchy. So what, I, what I'll do quickly um, is I'll pull up a few of your um, of your um, works in progress. And, and maybe we can just discuss, and maybe you can even, um, I'll start with the one, this one. Uh, maybe you can just even shout out what you're struggling with or what you, what you see yourself. Yes? Before we jump into that, I have one yeah. question. What separates a web font from a print font, I guess, to be, or and why would you want to Two things. One, this um, this problematic is different today in 2017 than it was maybe 10 years ago, because uh, browsers weren't able to render just any typeface. So you were relying to um, standard typefaces that you knew would be installed at the user's machine. So you had Arial, you had Georgia, you had Verdana, you had Courier. Um, and you had Georgia, uh, or Times New Roman. Um, and that's it, there was like five that you could reliably expect every single person with a computer to have and a couple of fallbacks. And then there was a uh, revolution, so to say, browsers all of a sudden were able to read any kind of font. Um, and that opened things up, so I would argue, so that's the first thing. Uh, and then you could, uh, you could argue you could just use any font, uh, with the caveat that many screens, um, including this one, not this one, not this one, but this one, are low resolution. So you actually see pixels. If you, if you look closely, you actually see this type being kind of broken up into, you know, into its pixels. So certain typefaces just don't lend themselves well for screen viewing. But even that is kind of an outdated, or starting to be outdated because of all these high resolution screens, right? Any any smartphone has more resolution than the printed page, oftentimes. Um, so nowadays, in terms of design, you can use any typeface on screen. Then it becomes a question of uh, legalities, and even their type foundries are catching up. It used to be maybe five years ago, there's some really awesome typefaces, but you can't get web licenses because people like uh, Hoefler and Fair Jones, it's a well-known type foundry, they were figuring out what to do, but they weren't licensing their fonts yet. But even that is starting to be kind of painless. And with Typekit, uh, you know, even free Google fonts, you have quite a big typographic palette. So good. So the answer is nowadays, mostly, there isn't a difference. Any other questions to that might have come up? Who's is this? Hello. Yasmin? Um, I'll just flip through this. We don't have to make this painful or, you know. Um, do you, um, 
so we'll just I'll just flip through it and um, we'll uh, we'll discuss it. One thing I'll realize uh, I recognize right away is the way you output this. We can probably change this in view page display two pages. Right? We'll look at it like this. Uh, you output this as single pages. Um, I think some of uh, some other people might have output spreads. Um, if you go to print, that's the way to output the PDF, because then the printer will take each individual page and put it in an order that makes sense for to, to make a book. If you want to output this for screen viewing, I would recommend to output it as, um, there's a, when you export, um, actually, I'm going to make quickly a list here. Export spreads versus pages. Um, there is a little tick mark that says use spreads or use pages, right? Uh, because you design it as two pages next to each other. Um, so you have um, some table of contents and some sections. Question. Are you guys going to add written information, like little explanations? Is that a requirement? Is that optional? Emma, do you know? Uh, if there's no specific requirement, I would say you would probably want, for most of these things, some at least little descriptive caption that explains like, what the medium is, maybe something about what the process is, just so that a reader would understand better. Like, if you say something like additive color processing, I don't know what that means. Mm. Context is important, right? It's especially. I don't think it has like body text to say, but it maybe has like small paragraphs. Yeah. Actions. Unless you have an introduction to a section that's more of a, like when you were playing with more of a kind of project narrative. Yeah. But I wouldn't say you should feel obligated to write that. It also depends, uh, you know, you think about your target audience a little bit, and this is maybe going back a little bit of. When I start a web project, especially, we kind of think about, well, who's the user? Who's the user for you guys, right? Who are you going to show this to? Um, is it for yourself, just to have a reference? Is this to apply to um, a school? I think so, right? Who's going to look at that? Do they need some context? Um, do you need to explain what you've done well? In some sense, you know, Anyone can show, you know, if, if I look at this, this is pleasing, you know, this is beautiful. I, I, I'm intrigued. Uh, but it's also so much, like, I don't know, what did you learn? What were you struggling with? What were you trying to do? How do I evaluate if this is good or bad? And, and that, I think, can come out of uh, a little bit of writing, right? Unless these are, these are exercises that every single admissions counselor or person knows and, you know, like a portrait. If I do a portrait of a person and want to apply to art school, people kind of know what a portrait is. Um, but then these seem quite, um, quite abstract and um, it feels like there is a story there to be told. And that's in a way you can also, you know, that's how you bring personality besides your visual stuff. Um, it's how you bring personality into your book by, you know, writing about it from a personal perspective. Um, so, what were you struggling with? Yeah.
Yeah, I think this is, and, and we'll, if I look at this, right, I'm not sure if there's an underlying grid here, but I also feel the way these images work together is kind of, you know, it's pretty nice. Like there's a nice, uh, there's beautiful kind of negative spaces uh, between these irregular shapes and they communicate pretty well with the stuff that's going on on the right. Um, although I also wonder, you know, if on the right we only had one of those um, crinkled papers, but really large. Then you have one thing large on the right, three things left, uh, three things on the left that are smaller, and you have a little bit more scale um, contrast, which could be cool. I think the way you, I mean, obviously you're, or seemingly in the very beginning here, um, I would urge you guys to give yourself enough space, not to say like, oh, I'm gonna have one page per project, right? But maybe it's three for one and then one page for another project, so it's a little bit more organic and not so, um, not so predictable. Because I could easily see after this page um, a whole spread that just has one of these, you know, these bodies really large, so you get the idea of how does that look as a detail. Yep, scaling. Images all Okay, oops. Uh, yeah, there is. Um, and it must be frustrating. It's like it has to do with holding down a special key. Um, I think you might have also, um, I don't know, you might have gotten into the, um, into the problem of scaling an image, but it's really just making the image box bigger, but not scaling the contents. You know, so there's, we can talk about that in a second. Um, if I look at your type, there's very little, but even here, right? I mean, what you're setting up uh, in terms of grid, obviously your headline and your subheadline are always hitting the same spots, which, you know, that's a fine strategy. Um, but I'm, so, but there you, you seem to have three things that you can play with. One, the headline, so bodies in space. Two, the numbers, 1.3. And then the subsection, right? You chose not to do anything, keep it very simple, which is an approach, that's fine. It's not like good or bad. Maybe it's like interesting versus being restrained, right? Or being expressive on the one hand and being kind of quiet on the other. You're on the quiet side with your typography, right? Uh, but you could use, you know, go, going back to this, this list, right? You could use scale or you could use weights or color to kind of separate those three elements. Um, okay, let's look at another one. I'm probably not gonna go through all of them, so if you say I wanna have mine talked about, you're welcome to shout it out. Otherwise, I'll kind of go um, in order. So here's an example of someone having output their PDF as spreads versus single pages, um, right? What we don't get here is a line in the middle now, but we can kind of assume that um, where, where the page break is. And also, this is, you know, in, in a way kind of funny. I, I heard from Emmett that um, not everyone might print this through, um, what's the? Blurb, blurb. Um, in some sense, um, if you know you're not going to print this with blurb, you might as well create a document that is not eight by 10, but 16 by 10, right? And just design it as one kind of horizontal artboard. Um, kind of doesn't make sense to have this kind of book approach to something that's only gonna live on screen, right? Um, by the way, I designed these lectures in InDesign. Right, and they are, you know, I didn't design it as a book, obviously, right, because I knew it was only going to be on screen. So you, um, if you know you're not printing, you might not want to have a left and a, and a, and a right page. 
Um, although I would urge everyone to go to print because it's kind of nice to have you know something physical in your hands. Um, but I understand it's optional. Right? Who is? Plus, it's a good exercise to go through that process, which is semi-complex, you know. Although Blurb, I know Emmett showed you the plugin to set up your document, etc. Uh, it makes it fairly easy. But there's some, um, you know, going through that project uh, process once, um, it sets you up to make other books in the future for, you know, projects or even for clients if necessary. Um, so um, let's. So there's okay. Aspirational empty pages here. Who's this? Okay, but you have one spread. Um, oh, wait, two spreads. Um, kind of a nice, um, a nice opening spread, right? Like really, like beautiful, a beautiful image, kind of striking. Um, I assume that this is the opening for a section. So that's something to think about in terms of structure, right? Do I wanna, what do I wanna do to start a section? Do I wanna have a solid color in some type? Do I wanna have a standout piece that kind of metaphorically, not even metaphorically, that um, describes one of these, uh, you know, surface and depth explorations? Um, do I wanna have an abstract detail of something? Um, do you want to be metaphorical? That's, I would, you know, think about something that doesn't relate to this at all that describes surface and depth. I don't know, deep sea diving. It's probably, you know, you could get cheesy very quickly. Uh, probably good to stay away from that. Um, one thing I'll say about the type here is uh, it's a serif typeface, right? Um, it has the little, little nicks. Um, at the end of the strokes, and it works pretty well for the um, headline, the body copy, or the caption or whatever, since it's reversed, it's white on black, it starts to kind of lose its details a little bit. And if you go to print, um, since ink usually bleeds a little bit, right? Like the what's white here will be the paper and the black ink is gonna be around it. When the ink bleeds just a little bit, you lose the detail. So it's maybe better to use a little bit of a bigger typeface or maybe switch to a serif, a sans serif uh, that doesn't have all these changes in weight. Um, and even on screen, you kind of see it's a little hard to see on this screen, right? Because it's pixelated and it starts to break apart a little bit. Um, but as an opening gesture, it's quite beautiful. One thing you'll want to think about in terms of printing is that you will have a gutter in the mid uh, middle, right? So you'll lose a little bit of the image to the left and to the right. For this particular image, it's probably fine, because if you lose a little bit of the middle, you know, you don't lose the idea. But there are certain images that like the most important prominent thing is right in the middle, like let's say a person's face, right? And then you only see the ears because the face is completely eaten up by, by, the, by the gutter of the book. Not ideal. Um, type two, you know, some people, you know, when you design, I'll just put a word, you know, my headline is gonna go all the way from the left page to all the way to the right page, but the letter that hits the, the, the middle, the, the kind of gutter, uh, it's going to be eaten up, so it's going to be hard to read. Uh, so those are considerations. Question. Yeah. How much space do you think about leaving for that gutter? Yeah, that's uh, it's hard to say. It'd be actually helpful to. 
it varies them based on uh, the production too. There's certainly books that lay com lie completely flat where you don't lose anything, right? The blur books probably don't do that. It'd be helpful to see an example, but I would leave um, one, when you'd create the blurb template, it might actually tell you with a guide, right? Uh, but half an inch. And it's not even that you have to, well, there's two things. If you have a text column that runs to the middle, you might want to leave even more space, maybe an inch, because it's gonna, it gets uncomfortable if it goes too close to the middle. Um, but in terms of something not even showing up, maybe it's half an inch or a quarter. And it also varies, I mean, depends how the book is uh, produced. It's probably just, it might be different on certain pages uh, because of the way that the, the, the book is produced. Um, okay. And then here it's funny, um, it's obviously a conscious choice that you have these captions that seem to relate to certain pieces, like, the left one seems to relate to the big piece on the, on the bottom left. Then you have a caption that seems to relate to the, the black square on the bottom right. But the captions are talking about different pieces, right? And you're using above, below. Um, it's curious because there's no reason for it, right? You have space. You could put that caption that says photographs of paper models just closer to those paper models, right? Same thing on the right side. Um, the kind of above below makes more sense when the captions are always in the same in the same area and kind of removed from everything. You know, let's say you always have the captions, you know, on the bottom right. And then you could even number, right? You could say one, two, three, four, and then put numbers on these pieces. But in this case, I don't really understand why the captions are both together relating to one piece but then talking about uh, separate pieces. In terms of um, composition, um, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about this trapped negative space here. You know, I'm wondering if this aligned to the left or if it was gone. I don't know if you have to show all three, maybe. Kind of create somewhat of a funny shape, but then I think this relationship is the one that's more problematic, like maybe because the space here and the space here is the exact same, so it kind of flattens out. If you pull these either further apart or closer together, you know, you have a little bit more uh, contrast in the negative space. In general, when things are the same, you know, usually it flattens things out and there's no contrast, less excitement, uh, and when things are different, you have the contrast. Okay, let's look at a, um, a few more. Anyone wants to go? Like, if you see your, yeah, which one is yours? This one? Yeah, I would just say about the last one quickly. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, that's sort of four discrete assignments, mini assignments within the larger thing. So I would just give them more space. Yeah. Color photographs. There's like four very different types of, of work on the same page, which can become difficult to, to sort of disentangle as part of the project. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point in terms of content. Um, it's, I mean, if you 
again, if you're printing, there's some costs involved, but it's fairly inexpensive to add a few pages. If you're on screen, it's basically for free, right? Just add another page. Um, the only question is if you're gonna wear out the welcome of who's looking at it if you have 200 pages. So there's the upper limit of adding too much. But in general, if you feel like things are too tight, it's just, you know, I'd like to see as, you know, to just follow up, a couple of big, it almost is a palette cleanser, right? It's like you flip the page or you go to the next slide and there's something really big. Cool, kind of a nice moment of, you know, pause. And then you can go on and show a bunch of small things again. All right, um, so this one we'll look at um, two pages again. So, you know, it's always good, um, I mean, this is just um, Lauren Ibsen type, right? Some, some kind of sample type. Uh, but it's good to see something that um, isn't quite working because it's, you know, you get to learn. And, you know, we talked about line length uh, a little bit, or I talked about line length a little bit in my typography lecture, and this is a clear example of that, right? If you ask someone, or if you ask yourself, do I wanna read this typography, right? Does this look like, hey, I'm gonna be interesting, do you wanna read me? Um, the answer is probably no, and the reason is it's just too many characters in a line. If you have that and just make the you know, the column a little longer, it's gonna be a lot more palatable and inviting. Otherwise, this particular spread, um, kind of like the, um, the contrast be the, between the all uppercase italic and um, the body copy. And there seems to be some kind of rationale to, to this grid, right? They, they align, they're not the same size, but they align along this axis, and then the gutter is the same between the elements, and they align along here, which is kind of nice. Question is if showing the same, you know, here I'm wondering then why this space is larger than this space, you know? maybe also to create difference, but it just kind of, you know, there's a fine line between, oh, it's different to create interest and it's different and it seems like a mistake or an oversight. So I think this kind of straddles the line. Um, and I'm also wondering if showing, you know, this is a nice example of maybe the spread should be, you have your paper compositions on the left. Oh wait, these are actually, wait, so these rhino, Tell me, do they relate, and how do they relate? And which one did you do, the upper left? Okay. So it's kind of interesting, right? Uh, how do you communicate that? That it's, let's see, that it's this guy that you're actually talking about here. That's kind of an interesting challenge. You know, even if you, if you put a colored line around that, you know, as in like, this is the one, and then put, I don't know, I'm just riffing, I guess, and I use this colored line as a background color for that page, so that, you know, kind of uh, relates. Um, so far, we haven't seen much color, right, as a background, so that's something to play with. If you wanna go that route, it can be, you know, kind of overwhelming quickly if you use too much color. Um, yeah, and here on the left side, um, oh, this is a good example. The type looks better, right, because it's, not as long. Yeah, I was trying a different template. Okay. I mean, this one here on the left, I'm wondering why everything is so small, right? I mean, but then I'm also, like I guess these three things 
they like relate, right? As in. Yeah, I think everyone will have that kind of challenge of how do you indicate what the process was, right? Which one of these explorations did you continue with? Um, so think about a strategy for that. Is there a reason why this is? I, <laughs> I mean, visually, I like it. You know, it's like something but then conception, it's, I mean, it's like making and meaning, right? It's like what you're talking about, designers think about that all the time. And I realized in my work, when things get really exciting visually, it's usually when I lose uh, legibility. You know, if the, if, when I'm working on a poster and you can't read what this thing is about anymore, it's usually when things get really exciting. And it's like, damn, but people need to read. Um, so same thing here, it's like, seems cool visually, but conceptually, you know, as you said, it's just an oversight. So it's kind of a question mark. Um, that's a beautiful page. It's a nice relationship um, between, you know, this big element, these three small ones. Um, kind of a nice contour. I mean, the, the thing itself is beautiful, which, which helps. Um, and this type, you know, starts to look kind of really, it's like in a way, you know, it's like your versions from kind of bad to pretty good. Um, and it's not the same, um, the same, it's not the actual content, but something I'd point out, um, just this is a default to hyphenation. When you have a small little caption and um, and non-justified text, just turn the hyphenation off. You don't really need it, right? It's not helpful in this case that there's this word and the letters ES are, cap uh, are hyphenated for the word then to continue on the next line. Unnecessary, in fact, it kind of creates a rag that is kind of puny. Right? If you look at that, it almost looks justified, but it isn't, so it kind of looks like a mistake. Almost, like it's just like not visually pleasant. If you take out the hyphenation, um, you'll get a more dramatic uh, rag on the right. And are you uh, imagining that you would leave that page empty? Yeah. However, that's a strategy, right? It might, maybe it doesn't work all, I don't know, it could work for a screen presentation, but it's certainly a strategy for uh, a printed book. Right? Every once in a while, it's just on the left, and there's nothing on the right, and there's just this moment of, of quiet. Right? So you're not inundated by stuff on every single, like, you know, by a lot of things on every single page. In fact, you could even try to move these three guys over here and see if it still holds up. Right? Um, or you could put more stuff there. I don't know. I don't, you know it depends what you want to do. But visually, it kind of works even like this. I don't know if it makes sense in terms of your flow of content. Yeah, and here I would uh, probably just use, this seems to be some kind of caption. I would just use uh, change the typeface, right? Kind of body copy, headline, and then this caption might be some kind of uh, sans serif to create a little bit of a different texture on the page.
Let's look at two more. Uh, any, any other volunteers? Yeah. Okay. Quickly, though, um, cover, right? That's someone, everyone. Some, I don't know if anyone has really attempted it. Nope. Nope. Kind of. <laughs> you know, very refined and understated. It's like very, hmm, like a five star restaurant. Uh, it's like I'm too cool to make a real cover. <laughs> Um, oh, oh, yeah, I mean, it's a strategy, yeah. Um, but then what, what else can you do, right? Can you use one project or one detail uh, that is kind of a stand-in for, um, for the entire, what, six weeks, four weeks? Four weeks. Um, is, it a, you know, is it a grid of multiple images that kind of shows a breadth uh, of... Um, of work, is it something conceptual? You know, again, that's tricky territory, right? Like m making and meaning of that's, and I don't even know if you wanna, I guess that's not even, that's the course, but it doesn't make sense for, maybe it doesn't make sense for the, um, for this portfolio. Um, what do you put on it, right? Do you have your name and the word portfolio? Does it need more? I don't know if there's instructions. Uh, does it need to say architecture? Does it need to say SciArt? Does it need to have a date, um, you know? Those are kind of questions you got to answer. Um, you can also make it just typographic, but have a lot of energy. Um, you know, some kind of typographic composition. Um, I mean, one more strategy, probably inappropriate, you can answer that, is some kind of you. Like, if you have a picture of you being, like, I heard, like, you were scanned, like, I guess, as your body. If you kind of use that, if you have a picture of that, as, like, hey, this is me doing this, you know, I don't know if that's appropriate for a portfolio, but certainly would kind of talk about process and, um, you know, it being an actual person that created this. Um, my sense, it's probably inappropriate, but, um, okay. Speaking of bodies, uh, my fear, Lou, no, Louis, right, Louis, um, is, are these distorted? Like, it seems like, or is that? So I have a grid for every page, so I just put the pictures And you squished them? No, I, um, it seems squished. Is that just me? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but as I said, I, I especially in this crit, I love s looking at things that are clearly wrong because everyone can benefit from it, right? You can fix it. Everyone else can kind of monitor if they've done something else or won't do it. Um, but there's something, um, you know, quite this, uh, I mean, I get a feel, like a kind of a nervous feeling looking at these bodies that are quite clearly, um, you know, distorted um, horizontally. So again, in InDesign, let's see, I'll make a note. Um, um, improper scaling of images. There's a way to uh, look at, like, select an image and see if you've somehow changed the dimensions. Um, so here's someone with uh, more type, right? Something I forgot to say in my lecture about um, creating or indicating new paragraphs, right? Remember, there were two ways, indent and space. Ideally, you don't do both, right? Because it's simply unnecessary. You're already indenting here, but then you're also leaving a space, right? Uh, it's probably best to just choose one or the other. Um, but I like that there's type. Did you write this? Yes. I think that's really helpful. Um, what's not helpful is the hyphenation, right? Same, I already talked about it. Like, 
look at this making being broken up, right? This is like, you know, maybe one of the last passes you would do looking at things, but um, just turning off the hyphenation um, is probably going to help with that. And then also printing it out, my sense is it's a little hard to, um, to tell here on, on screen, but my sense is that your type's a little too large. Do you remember what, type, uh, what font size you have? Um, that body is 14. 14. Yeah. I think you're, if you make the type just a little bit smaller. You can also do things like the first paragraph is large, right? Like maybe it's 16 or 18, and then you go to 12, right? If you have some kind of introductory. I mean, that's a well-worn strategy if you think about books, right? this kind of lead-in paragraph. Yeah, there's something, I, I have to say, you're, the images here, um, you know, partly because they are, um, they are distorted, but there's something about the presentation that doesn't feel um, kind of resolved. Like, I wonder if one of these, if you, you know, blow up one of these, um, like make them bigger, um, And maybe it's also the, um, let's see. It's quite creepy. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. I mean, in that sense, it might actually be fine that they're smaller, right? Because you don't get any that much mileage out of making them bigger. Because there's, then the question is, you know, so this is in a way just you, describing your process. Yeah. Right? Seems fine on the left. Um, captions are probably just too big. Right? And there's a, if you look at this, there's a lot of, I mean, again, you probably haven't fine-tuned things, but there, you know, there's three paragraphs. Um, could, they, could there be some space after the paragraphs? Um, this is kind of an odd move, this like straight diagonal, like pointing from one edge of the page to the other edge of the page, you know. Yeah, I would use some scale, you know. Maybe one of these that you like. But let me ask you, is this a progression of steps or are they, uh, or are they just different iterations of the same thing? Yeah, so I think one could be bigger and then you'll resolve this kind of awkwardness of everything being the same. That's kind of a, somewhat of a problem on this page, right? There's seven images and they all kind of feel visually of the same kind of scale and importance. Yeah. 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 If you, what is it called? If you hit Command B, you go into, I think, the text box options, and you can add padding to a text box. So you could add to a top bad padding of, like, let's say, five points or something. Um, so we'll, hold on, we'll text box options, text box options. Um, I just see it's 1247. Uh, it's probably best one, we don't have another break, and we'll probably, I'll move into InDesign in a second and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, yeah, in terms of spacing, this is a good point you bring up. Um, like, 
again, you might not be, you know, this is, doesn't seem all that figured out yet, right? But this, they are not being any space between the headline and, and the, um, the image uh, feels very, like if you think about it and, see, and, and, and like monitor how it makes you feel, like I kind of, my heart rate goes up a little bit, it makes me a little uncomfortable, um, you know, this too, right? And that's probably not what you want to communicate to the person that, um, that you're showing your portfolio to, right? Make them nervous. Wonder if that L will ever touch that bottom and what might happen. I just. I'm not sure about that typeface. That's Optima, isn't it? No, it's the uh, Oh, looks like Optima a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little. You know, it's a little flimsy, right? Yeah, good point. Are you using this throughout? It seems to have just, huh. You don't really notice that when it's, um, when it's smaller. Like it's body copy, like I barely notice it, but when, when it gets bigger and you start focusing, it, it's, it's a little awkward, yeah. Um, okay. Um, Oh, here, someone is using, I mean, this is a nice strategy, right? It's inversing, using a black background so the images feel different. Um, Just talk about matching black. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I can go to See that again? Matt? Oh, the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we should talk about color modes. Oh, that's... My, my um, suspicion is that your document, since this is a printed print, or set up for print InDesign document, is, is, is it's in CMYK. So if you use a CMYK black that, you know, it's like four colors and black is 100% and cyan, magenta, and yellow are zero, that is not the same color as an RGB black that you probably got from doing a screen grab, right? That's why the screen grab black is darker than the uh, CMYK black. I might almost recommend, and I just had that experience of doing a book that was also printed in, in an on-demand um, printer, just choose, change everything to RGB, you know? It's like there's this, obviously, this um, thing about when you go to press, you need to be CMYK, but these on-demand printers actually have a larger spectrum because they're printing digitally. They're not putting this on a printing press, right? It's coming out of a, I don't know, a laser printer. Um, and using just CMYK for everything, even your InDesign document, uh, I'm sorry, RGB, um, might alleviate these problems and actually get you richer colors in the end. That's at least my experience. And I just did that. Um, yeah, here, you know, is the question, is this helpful to show 50 or like 20 things uh, this small, right? So each one, each set is one piece. Oh. But still, right, maybe they should be bigger. If you're, yeah, if you're gonna compile a grid of images, I wouldn't just take a screenshot in Rhino of all of those next to each other. I think I would, I would put each one as an individual image so you have the capacity of the design to manipulate. Yeah. That's starting to look pretty nice. There's just too much, I mean, I can squint at it and see it be working, right? There's too much distractions, and I think mainly by the fact that you have this SD figure four. What does SD stand for? Surface and depth. Seems unnecessary, right? Unless you have all your captions in the back, you don't need to, like, put a modifier in front of it, just, you know, you don't even need to see figure, just put a, a four. Right? And in fact, you can go one step further, since there's one captions for all of them, you can just 
take everything out, and this caption stands for this page quite clearly. That's probably what you should do, just simplify it. Yeah. The, does it work? Um, I kind of feel, yeah. What, you don't? No, I do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, emotionally, I feel like there's a nice balance. Right? There are these kind of two columns on the left, three columns on the right. Uh, it feels even, well, not quite, but if you, it, let's see. It almost feels like there seems to be some logic of, um, of the units involved, like some inherent um, relationships of this larger, you know, this might be a two to three ratio, and this is a one to three ratio, right, uh, in terms of the scales to one another. Oh, you mean the different blacks? No, I don't think that works. I was just, I thought we had settled that and we'll make it all the same black. Um, it's just too small of a contrast that it just makes it seem like a mistake. If the black in the background was lighter, so it became more of a gray, I'd be interested to see how that looks, but then you're starting to see, it seems unnecessary to make more boxes, right? Because these negative shapes of these, uh, of these images are quite beautiful when they float in space, but now you actually started to put them all into boxes. Um, and they can't really kind of float in the entire space. Um, oops, that's me. Um, what's nice here is that you're obviously quite far along and putting stuff on the pages. Um, you know, you have quite a few uh, compositions. Okay, let me um, move into InDesign really quickly uh, before we wrap up and uh, discuss some of these uh, issues that came up and maybe also show you how I set up um, a document um, for, this, um, for, for this problem uh, of, of making a portfolio. Let's see if I can... There it is. Okay, so um, we we can look at the grid. I mean, you know, obviously this, you know, not I mean, the, now that I think about it, it's your portfolio created during the making and meaning, right? But if it was a um, a uh, a book about your time here, you know, something like that could work. It needs a name, obviously, etc. But it's just a bold typographic gesture. Um, but more importantly, here is um, just a, an idea of, a, um, of an opening spread for a section. Um, big image on the left, uh, you know, three pieces of uh, typography, a caption, a headline, and some kind of uh, type explaining the process. Running header and footer, I, you know, there's some kind of type, um, some kind of um, page number on the bottom right. And, you know, this, I'm saying making and meaning, but it could say your name, portfolio, or something. Um, and then the next page, you know, this could be, it's very sparse, but this could be a sample layout, but don't be afraid of um, white space, I'd say, right? And maybe I would encourage you to go from, like the next page here, I could almost imagine, um, you know, some kind of big detail. So you have this kind of pacing. And again, I said this earlier, it's kind of like a movie, right? Establishing shots, close up, and this kind of back and forth. Um, so, and notice that the page numbers on the bottom left, bottom right, um, you know, here it was covered up, um, and that's fine. Um, 
so they don't have to show all the time the page numbers. Um, let's look at the grid just um, for a second. Um, what I did in this, and this is really just um, an example um, you know, that I put together fairly quickly, but I, there's this option, uh, you might have used this um, under layouts and create guides that allows you to create just a grid on the page. Um, so what I did, I just, you know, nudged the numbers until I had something that was kind of squarish. I don't know what the numbers were, but it was probably like 24. Um, you know, I, I don't know, this is now adding to um, the existing one, but it might have been 24 and, and 36, something like that, until there was something that I kind of liked as, as the smallest unit. Um, and then after that, I established my margins. So if you notice, the top margin is three units and the left margin is two units. Um, and the inner margin is also two units and the bottom margin is, is three. Um, and then I can kind of align, start aligning things on here, right? And not, you know, I mean, this is just like the beginning of if I was to do this project probably nudge this guy a little to the right. Um, but you can kind of see that, um, you know, there's three units between the caption and the, um, the headline and the body copy. Um, now that I see this, um, there's probably too much space here. Like, it hits the grid nicely, but it's really, you know, if you turn it off, that's something like a grid can be a great help, but it can also be a straitjacket if you use it incorrectly, or if you kind of, you don't want to be a slave to your grid. Like, it seems like this makes sense, this space, but when you turn off the grid, you know, it's not there, so you don't really feel this one unit between here. It kind of just feels like the space is too large. So if I go to my paragraph palette here, um, it's 18, 18 points, the space after, um, my typeface is 14, so I would probably just make it um, 14 points. Um, oh wait, it's on the bottom one. Okay, it's a space before. There you go. You know, small little change, but all of a sudden this type kind of feels like it belongs together a little more. In fact, maybe, you know, one could argue maybe 12 is even better. Oh, here, this one. Okay, um, and then the other question is, now that you have this grid, let's look at the next page, uh, right? So what do you do with it when it comes to pages where you wanna show a bunch of things? Like I opted for just some kind of, you know, scale, scale changes and um, like a relationship that is equally predictable, like these two images hang from the same uh, grid line, uh, but also kind of unpredictable, like this image actually goes all the way, you know, it bleeds off. This is something I maybe didn't see enough. It's something you can employ, something that runs off the page, feels very different than, than this, right? This image now feels like it has a box around it, which kind of, with some negative space here, but if you do this, it kind of feels like it's going off in the distance and it has you know, like a more expansive feeling. Um, in this system, I'd say like maybe the, my establishing, you know, this is another you know, section, it's very similar than the first, maybe, except this still needs an image, maybe this stays the same, but these are different, right? If you compare this page, three images, and the composition of this page, you know, different grid. So you can kind of now, uh, or different constellation. Um, but again, there's one big image, just two small images. There's some kind of balance that's achieved, but also some, you know, amount of drama. Um, so let's, let's look at some of these issues that came up. Export, right? So if I wanted to export this, 
command E. It is it's, uh, F, uh, hand signal. Who's on a Mac for you guys? Okay, the other way, who's on a PC? So there's few, like one third, two thirds. Um, obviously, command, control, you, you get the idea. Or you can go to the file menu and say export. Um, um, if you, in this dialog box, um, right here, pages versus spread, that's what people did differently. Right? Some people said spreads, that's when both pages that are next to each other, when you're looking at the document in InDesign, they output next to each other. Uh, you should do that if you want to export it for someone to look at it on screen. Um, when you say pages, each page, like the left page and the right page, they are disconnected. And they all output um, separately. And you would do this right before you send it to Blurb, because that's what Blurb needs. Uh, what else is on here? Uh, interrupt me if you have questions, by the way. Yeah. 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 Well, so that's a good, so how do you even know what's happening, right? If you, if you find your info palette minus, you know, up here, I'm actually going to break it out, put it here. And then you use your wide arrow, the direct selection tool, and you click on one of these images, you'll find an, a number in here. Do you see this? It says actual PPI, pixels per inch, and effective PPI. The effective PPI, that's the one you want to look at. And if you want to go to print, or even for high resolution screens, you want to be around 300. If it's a lot lower, like here, it's one because I scaled up this image, that means the resolution goes down, like the pixels per inch, because I'm you know, covering a larger area. So here it's 172. It's not going to be ideal for printing. Um, and if I make, let's say, you have an instance here. This is 758. It's too much. Right? So if you output this at full quality to a PDF, the PDF is going to be really large. Um, However, when you export your PDF, if you use high quality print, if you look under the compression settings, it does downsample, right? The color images, it's downsampling to 300 pixels per inch for images above 450. So automatically you'll have some compression and some downsampling. If you turn this off, however, if you say do not downsample, then you would export the full and unnecessarily export all the information for each image. Um, That's a really good point for exporting it for screen. You might have seen that before that you open up a PDF and it takes five seconds to render because all these kind of you know, small vector um, graphics are being assembled and changing it into a raster image, like a high quality JPEG might be, might be better in that instance, depending on the complexity of your vector graphic. Um, so some, there was a question about scaling all images at once. Uh, so let's say 
I want to scale these three images, right? So if I select all of them, um, so I choose my direct, my, my what's that called? It's like the first arrow, right? The black arrow, the selection tool. Um, and I select these. And you might have run into this. If I just go on the bottom right here, my mouse turns into a resize tool. Um, now I clicked off it. Um, that's not what I want. I'm merely changing um, the, um, the boxes. Uh, if I hold down a special, a special key, however, and you gotta, let's see, I kind of intuitively know which one that is. Well, I actually have to hold down two keys, but let me start with one. If I hold down, for me, it's, I'm on a PC, it's control. For me, it, for you on a Mac, it might be command. That's when they all change together. So holding down command or control while resizing uh, changes them all. But if you're not careful, you can also end up with this. That's why when you resize anything, you should be holding down shift right, to, um, to uh, resize proportionally. So I'm holding down now two keys, control and shift and now I can only resize it proportionally. Um, the other thing is uh, you can use the scale tool. Uh, it's hanging out somewhere here, halfway down the toolbar. And then you can just, you know, scale that. And again, holding down shift is helpful. Otherwise, things get distorted. Um, but yeah, it's about holding down that. Um, that key. That's true. Yeah. And right. That's that's a good point. It's also this little guy here on the top right corner, left corner, indicates the um, the center point for any transition or no transform. The center point for a transform, or the origin. They call it a reference point. So if I put that at the top left corner, and then, let's see, there you go, and then make this 200%, my um, checkbox here for constrained proportions is turned on, then it's you know, modifying everything from the top left corner and not from the center anymore. So let's say you come to an image and it looks suspicious like those bodies we saw earlier uh, in terms of are they distorted or not, how do you find out, right? You know, if I go to another page and then come back to this, it's like, uh, I'm not sure if these are distorted or what. If you click on them with your white arrow tool and then look up here, if these two numbers aren't the same, they are not scaled correctly. Right. Here, the width is scaled to be 122% or uh, percent, and the uh, height is scaled to be 87. So you just go in here and say, well, let's set it back to oops, 100. And then you can go from there. Obviously, now that the box isn't, the box isn't um, you know, it's cutting things off, so you have to kind of, you know, kind of reset things. Uh, but that's something that can happen quite easily because when you organically design and you're shifting things around and you're resizing things, it's easy to either forget to hold down shift or to let go of shift just a second or millisecond before you let go of your mouse and then um, things get distorted. Options. Text box. Oh, so someone was asking, right. So let me just undo this. Um, so let's say I have this scheme of having this text box line up right there. That's my, my system, right? But obviously, I don't want it to touch. So the question was, I'm going to leave some space. But it's always kind of intuitive or by eye. You could do something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? And that's your, you always do that. <laughs> kind of ridiculous. Um, the other thing is hitting Command-B. What is that? It's under Type 
or is it object? It's, ob it's text frame objects. That's what it's called. And in here, you have this inset spacing. And you would uncheck the middle, because we just want to add, yep, add things to the top. Let's say we just want 10 points on the top. OK, so this gives you this, um, this spacing. Really, what this is for is for when you have a background color on a text box. Let's say my text box is, is yellow. Oops. Uh, to have some padding. Because it's kind of, as you can see on the left, where we don't have the padding, it's kind of uncomfortable. Right? So that's mostly what this is used for. But you can use it somewhat as a, as a, a crutch for you to, or as a guide, for uh, aligning things. So now I can easily you know, move it there. And I know that um, my text is always the same uh, distance. And if you want to go one step further, and again, this is kind of expert territory that you might not want to deal with, but you can create an object styles style. Um, I know Emma talked a little bit about character and paragraph styles, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but there's even something called an object style where I could create in my object styles palette, I can say new style. Hold on, I'll actually. Oh. There you go. Uh, I'll call it caption. And now I can go to um, another page where I have a caption here. And I could just make delete this guy. Okay, not going to delete it. I could just click on it, and that gets transferred. And if I change this op uh, caption uh, object style, um, I'd have to find where it is. But uh, if I change it, then the entire document would change uh, as well. So I'm not sure if for you, do, I don't know, some people might be working in design for the very first time. You know, there's, you know, it takes a while to get to these, um, to these tools that are kind of expert tools. So you might be, you might have your hands full with just figuring out the basics. But if you feel like you're a little advanced and you want to make your life easier, using character, paragraph, and object styles is certainly, um, certainly the thing to do. OK, uh, quickly, if color modes. OK, so we were talking about the color mode. If I look at, um, if I hover over black here, this is the culprit. See the, um, the tooltip, the mouse tooltip that comes up? Do that again. It says C0, M0, Y0, K100%. And RGB black um, usually has different numbers. It probably has cyan, magenta, and yellow also at some numbers. It's also called a rich black. And that's why when you combine an RGB file with a CMYK file, you get these different um, um, blacks. But you can go to the... Um, under the file menu, or is it under the edit menu? It's called the transparency blend space. And you could set this to RGB. And then, um, and then also, maybe, um, say that again. I don't, document setup? I don't think it's there. It might be there when you first create the document, but then they get separated into separate things. Like the margins are there when you create a document, but then you can't find them under document setup uh, after the document is created. Um, and then you might want to uh, create a new, um, a new black right here and set it to RGB. See, this is the problem. When you convert a CMYK black to RGB, it's not 000, but it's 35, 31, 32. So you say 000, uh, I don't know, you call it something like RG, um, RGB black. And then you use this for black everywhere. 
then those two blacks actually match. I mean, inherently, or it started, InDesign started as a purely print layout program, right? So there are these, these things that kind of get in the way when you're trying to do something that's not um, for necessarily a printing press, even if it's printed during, you know, through some other um, process. For example, if you have a, um, um, a laser printer or an inkjet printer, I would always stay with RGB because you get richer colors. Uh, the only time to go to CMYK is if you're actually going to press and they're having, you know, four different um, printing plates, et cetera. Go ahead. The colors over here? No, it won't. Maybe when you create, I actually don't, uh, that's, I'm not, um, if you create, uh, I wonder if you create a web-based document. Uh, let's try this out for a second. Yeah, see, now you actually have RGB swatches. So if you start that way, but you can also change them after the fact. And again, it doesn't actually matter that you have a, if you like this blue color that's based on CMYK, that's fine. It just won't match. It, it, this was just about having the blacks match. Uh, there's no reason to convert them. When you export the PDF, it'll be automatically converted. Um, That's one way. Right. That's a good point. Um, I think these are all the things that I um, wrote down. Does anyone else have any any questions um, before? we venture into the rest of the day. I'll say one more thing about character and paragraph styles, but any, any other stumbling blocks to you, Ekander? Last chance. Um, so I know Emmett touched on this briefly. Um, I'll just reiterate what I've done here uh, I'm gonna bring up my paragraph styles. Um, I, I set up three paragraph styles, right? There's one, and if I click on this, um, this headline, it lights up, you know, it's selected here, so I can see, oh, this headline is attached to the paragraph style headline one. Um, this up here is caption, and this here is called intro text. Um, if I, you know, click on the headline and make this into intro text, you know, not surprisingly, it changes into the same, um, into the same style. The advantage of this is, imagine having laid out the entire book. Well, two things. One, you have, you're more consistent, right? If you, um, like kind of play it loose in terms of size or in terms of any kind of, you know, the, the letter spacing, you know if this is selected when you click on something, it's going to be consistent to all other elements that are, have this style applied. The other thing is if you in the end decide, well, this headline is just a little bit too big, maybe you finally print it or the red isn't the right red, you can double click the, um, the paragraph style and change it. So if I go to, um, to color, text color, character color, that's what it's called, and say, well, I don't want it to be red anymore. I want it to be um, magenta. I can update it, and now my entire document, you know, everywhere where I'm using this, this style, is instantly updated. So it saves you a lot of time. That's really the, the biggest reason, Consi the two biggest reasons, consistency and ease of updating. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, if you're unsure how to create paragraph styles, you know, just, you know, look it up on the internet and there's probably a small tutorial. It's not all that difficult, right? I think 
the real, you just need to know that they exist and why they exist, and you can figure out uh, if you want to use them, and if you want, if you do want to use them, you can figure out how to um, how to learn how to. Um, character styles are a little bit different. Paragraph styles are always for the entire paragraph. Character styles are for separate words or even just one letter inside of a paragraph. And I have one instance here where I say, you know, this word technique that can't be a paragraph style, but it can be a character style. So if I uh, select this, you can kind of see in the character style panel, this, this uh, style that I call technique uh, is, um, is selected. So if I wanted to make this word across the same style, right? And similarly, I can, um, you know, let's say we wanted to be, if I change this, the whole word to be read. Um, uh, you'll see, well, I probably have to do it here. I have to double click it under character color. I have to choose red. And then if I zoom out a bit, you know, it updated both references. And if I, you know, look into the entire, through the entire document, you know, not rocket science, but really helpful. Um, it's also, as you design, you know, it makes it easier to just select a piece of text, apply this style, done. Without, you know, sometimes you're choosing three or four properties, right? The color and the underline and the type uh, size and the type uh, the, the typeface. So making styles, um, it's just helpful. I don't know if I would do that right in the beginning as you're still exploring your, um, your kind of graphical sensibility of the thing. But at one point I would stop and say, I kind of have it nailed down. I got these three pages designed. Now I'm gonna go back and I kind of systematize, create some styles, and then I can design um, the rest of the pages. Um, okay, uh, unless there are any other questions, Emma, should we uh, say anything else about the, uh, the next steps for, for them? Yeah, it probably is easier if we separate, maybe we have three groups. It's probably helpful to have printouts versus um, screen because it's hard to see everything at once for consistency, but it doesn't have to be in color if that helps. Yeah, and it's actually not, yeah. If anything, you could like bring out your black and white uh, printouts and then maybe have your laptop if you have one um, close by if you need to reference color if you're using a lot of color. Yeah, so let's just say print out your book in spreads, so you're both pages next to each other, on 11 by 17, so it's full scale, like print it at 100%, so 10 by 16 should fit on 11 by 17, no problem. Um, and so print out your book in a, in a kind of package of spreads, and then we can like play it out on the table. Okay. Yeah. Extra credit would be to print it with crop marks and actually cropping it to scale, because you know, otherwise you don't really know where the margin is. Or on your master page, you didn't talk about master pages today, but I think you did in your uh, introduction, put a frame around the entire thing, you know, on your master page, so that when you print it, you have some kind of border. So we kind of have a feeling of where the page ends when you print. Um, what is that 16 by? 16 by 10 on a 11 by 16. Um, that's really helpful to really get a feel of what this, you know, what the design looks on the page, to have a frame around it. But it, it'd actually be best if you just cropped it. Um, I just 
before we leave, I, I mentioned this earlier. Um, again, if you, mm, oh, okay, hold on. I guess um, if you want to refer to anything that I talked about, especially that demo that I showed, like the InDesign file that I had set up, if you just want to look at that and look at my grid, and um, then you can download the InDesign packet there and the typography lecture as well. Okay. All right, good luck. Um, looking forward to seeing your, uh, your books almost a week from now. Okay. Thank you.